Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really glad to welcome you here uh, at camp at Institute of Planning and Development. Uh, the weather is bad, the COVID is bad, but hopefully today's conference um, will focus on something that uh, is positive for our city and for our future. Um, I am really glad that I can welcome you here on behalf of Norwegian Embassy, Institute of Planning and Development, and ICT operator. Smart City is a concept uh, that used to be, a couple of years ago, a huge buzzword, and uh, those who live in Prague know it. Uh, uh, we were talking about it all the time, uh, writing huge articles, papers, discussing it during debates, but then um, the debate kind of slowed down, and you can see it in the media. We don't talk about it that much. There are various reasons for that, but it's a shame from my perspective because Prague as a city and all major cities in Europe they need smart cities more than ever. We have old, accelerating challenges, environment, population increase, and then we have new, accelerated challenges, diseases, COVID, social distancing. And in all this mess and all this restructuring of cities, we need to figure out how to develop innovative, sustainable, uh, good future for us to live in the cities. And today's conference will focus on this, and I'm really glad that I can welcome here experts, uh, great people that can share insight with us on how to build uh, innovative uh, Prague. These expertise and insights come from Norway, from great examples on how to build and collaborate uh, within all the stakeholders that are really essential for future of Prague, that is civic society, businesses, and city council. Uh, there is not many of us today, but I'm really glad that I can welcome uh, here all the viewers online. You can watch us on Vimeo or on Facebook stream of Norwegian Embassy. So please, if you are watching us online, feel free to, to join us and feel free to ask questions. Uh, if you look on Slido, hashtag sharing future, you can uh, post questions and I will be really glad to address them during our panel discussions today. The conference is in English. It will be in English throughout the whole day. There is a simultaneous translation, uh, so if you need, you can take the uh, headphones and feel free to use them. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's all from me for now. Uh, before we start, uh, I'm really glad to welcome here uh, Vich Himral, city councillor, and uh, Ger Beckfold, charge d'affaires of Norwegian Embassy. Gentlemen, please, uh, if you can come and uh, share a couple of uh, words with us. Here is the microphone. If you need a clicker, uh, this is the green button, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nikita, uh, for the warm welcoming words. And uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome you all uh, here uh, on behalf of the city of Prague. Um, originally, uh, the Lord Mayor was supposed to be here. Unfortunately, uh, there's a conference of the head of regions uh, about the current uh, pandemic situation, today's numbers, and what will be uh, the next steps in uh, trying to limit the, the, the raising numbers of coronavirus in the Czech Republic. So I have to excuse him. Uh, I, I saw his speech uh, that he was uh, originally wanted to, to give uh, uh, at this moment uh, for you. It was all about Golimio uh, because he's personal, very, um, uh, he's, uh, his looks on Golimio, which is our uh, open data platform, he's very proud of it. And, and he talks only about Golimio and everything that it does for Prague, which is great. But obviously, that's his uh, personal choice. Uh, and since I'm also city councillor for innovation, I, I, I innovated the speech. And I will be talking about basically uh, everything else but Golimio, because you will hear about Golimio during the day as well. Um, I will be talking about my personal experience with uh, what is smart city and what is sustainability. Um, curiously enough, uh, over the last weekend, I was uh, doing, um, uh, I was working on a project and I was doing pest analysis. Uh, you may know it's an essential elemental uh, tool of strategic management that if you start a project, you need to do analysis of external factors. And I, do, uh, and I did pest analysis because I learned that at school. 
You know, when I was going at the university, there were people who learned about project and strategic management in the 1970s. So they transferred the knowledge to us uh, and, and we, we, we still do personalizes. Even though the project I was working on was a digital token that was supposed to help environment or, or will be helping environment in the future, I basically, it dawned on me that I didn't include in the analysis all the other factors that we since the 1970s learned to include in the analysis. Obviously, most importantly of them, environmental factors. So nowadays, instead of PEST, we are doing steeple, we are doing pestle analysis and uh, other similar methods. But since I you know, learned at school, automatically I just used PEST. That was completely stupid, obviously. So for me, really the smart way how to now proceed into you know, a future, brighter future and, and a sustainable future is to also start thinking in a smart way in our everyday life, in our everyday life back at home and as well as at work. So for me, sustainability is now, at a, 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 and, and being smart, is now about uh, trying to include in our every step we take and every action we take uh, both at home and as a part of the municipality uh, to really include sustainability and it clicks at, at the first you know, second you do anything. And I think this conference might be a start of something like that. To, sh to share the experience that we have as municipalities in Norway and in the Czech Republic, that when we include and try to implement smart city solution into the working of the city, it has to always be sustainable. Basically, you can't do nowadays in the current climate, and I mean it both figuratively and literally, in the current climate, you shouldn't implement smart city solutions that are not at the same time sustainable. And I think this, is, this should be the, the, the message of, the, of, the, of, the, of today's conference, and I hope it will be just the first kickoff of many more events and common projects that we, uh, Prague, the city of Prague, and Norwegian municipalities and all other municipalities that would like to join us uh, from Europe uh, can do and should do. So uh, welcome again to Prague. I'm very much looking forward to your presentations, including Limeo, and enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and good evening. to you. Welcome to the conference, as said, and we're sharing fully the philosophy expressed by you, uh, Councillor Simral, smart city to be embedded and included in the policies. Uh, I'm saying that this is the fifth, this is the, we, after five smart conferences in the Czech Republic, we are back to where we started in 2015 in, uh, in, in, in Prague. And so we have been to, um, we have been to Bruno, Ostrava, Pilsen, and also to Czeske Budjevice. And the representative is sitting here from them. And this year we are also celebrating 100 years of diplomatic relations with the Czech Republic. And you can have all got this booklet possible for you to see, but it shows the co close cooperation with our countries. We have some projects, an important part have been the EA grants. We have 1,300 projects so far, some of them under the smart uh, city concept, but there are certainly possibilities for more. And we are also looking for new periods. So, very much, and what you said is really that we have to be concrete, we have to look at the green thinking. I must say that smart city is really a demanding and cross cutting task. We have the possibility to work, how the municipalities and regions should join and use or use EU programs in Norway. And what we can see is that it really needs uh, municipality authorities industry and not place the research community to work together. I think here we have set up, I've seen the CVs of the person speaking here, it's impressive. You are working in both directions towards solving citizens' problems and make their day life easier, but also in cooperation with the industry. Uh, Norway has taken the lead in the Nordic region, both by creating a national roadmap, which has been now also transferred to, Europe, to the Nordic level, but also by the Nordic Edge Con Conference with 5,000 participants. So my reflection a little from my period of this is that what you need has been fully demonstrated here today. And that is you need full political support. 
that goes for all levels. Without prioritizing, without giving the right signals, then nothing will happen. And as you said, you have to get everyone to think green. And Oslo, as an example, had a clear long-term ambition anchored in policy documents and also adopted by the city, uh, city council to go green. And also, they took it, uh, initiatives at European level, as the Euro cities, to chair the circular economy working group. It meant in practice that when the people from Oslo went to Brussels, they met the same people as our experts going to the commission working groups. So they were meeting and it was important to set up networks so that the signals expressed by Oslo was the same and also to see that they helped each other to use and present Norwegian ideas into the commission and EU work. Let me also address Stavanger facing the North Sea, as you know, oil city. Uh, and it's working closely with the neighboring municipalities uh, support uh, in the Rogaland in order to get also the region to be, and the notion is called Greater Stavanger Region. It's a concept. They have also since 92 had an office branch working for them to connect to Europe. And the example of that, I've used that as an example in Norway, a municipality of 19,000 inhabitants, Tima. They have both a smart, uh, smart not city, smart strategy, but also an international European strategy. Very simple. But telling how to work with European issues, EEIM, we talk it in Norway, in order to connect the municipality to ongoing European work. Very inspiring and very simple, but also very positive. Uh, one thing is clear, and that is the coordination. Both Trondheim and Stavanger has worked on the concept of breaking down the administrative silos. And it's very impressive that, that when the top officials of the municipality of Trondheim says as a conference, I want each of my heads of units to become innovation generals. 250 persons of the heads of units are put back to the school, bank, school to teach and get the innovation aspect into all units. And in addition, make a cooperation program, three, uh, Trondheim 3.0, with, with the SINTEF and the NTNU, the leading research in, innovation uh, universities in this area in Norway, also located. So it meant you are make connecting up in that direction. So what you could see is that there is no accident that you are obtaining prices, slow green capital, winning prices as Trondheim in relation to good transport solutions, etc. It's, it's a consequence of a long-term policy. This is something we go for, and to take new solutions into account. I must say also that working as a bureaucrat, I hope not the same here, but working as a bureaucrat, I noticed some difference. When I came to the Nordic Edge the first time, it was like a melting pot. You could feel the sentiments of change coming in, the sentiments of change, a willingness to do something, to create the solutions which was booming, oozing in the room. And that is then the interest of finding new, good, innovative solutions. We also saw that in the drop down of the oil industry, we saw that they changed to other, use their technology in order to support new solutions. So uh, I hope then that uh, we are today will have the possibility then to learn from each other examples we will hear from Oslo, Stavanger, and Trondheim. We will hear about Nordic Edge. We will hear about Norway's use of electrical vehicles. And also, finally, to company Tomra and the sorting technology in the food mining and waste management. So I hope then that we then also will listen, have good feedback on, the, on experiences from your side, uh, from Prague and the Czech Republic, and the possibility to have projects uh, coming up. So let me go in for a landing. To thank, uh, thank you for, for having this opportunity, for organizing it, and it's been a pleasure and privileged position to, to prepare it and organize it. 
and also a special thanks to the city of Prague. I was intending to, to give a small gift to the mayor, but I'm so dedicated that I would like to give it to you. Uh, first, before we do that, a special thanks to the colleagues working on the issue in the Prague city and the engagement optimism, Jeremy Beranek, uh, Helena, yeah, 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 and thank you for that. And here is a small uh, token to, to the, to the um, air, Lord Mayor Rib, and it's uh, also a token of the cooperation we have in the Arctic area with the Czech Republic. Okay, it's wrapped. So. Yeah, it's wrapped. So we, <laughs> it, you can see from the outside what it is. Okay. So thank you. So this goes into the collection, obviously. Yeah. The city collection. It's not for me. <laughs> it's for the city. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you. And thank we can, you. have a good conference. And I'm also joining in. So we're looking forward to the results. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen, uh, for a uh, nice and warm uh, welcome. And I'm really glad that uh, we start uh, by giving each other gifts, uh, that's a good start. Um, so our first part uh, of the conference, um, let's talk about what it means to be smart and how to create a, a good roadmap towards smart city. I would like to welcome here um, Gunnar Edwin Crawford, uh, who is a head of Stavanger Smart City and steering group member of SmartBN, the Norwegian Smart City Network, please. And if you need, sorry, if you need a clicker, I have a presentation. The green one is, is forward. OK. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Thank you to my uh, long uh, time old friends from Prague. Um, I'll get back to that. Uh, and thank you to uh, Trondheim and Oslo joining us here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the roadmap, as was pointed out, uh, but also how we have uh, managed to um, work on smart cities on a national level in Norway, how we cooperate, how we do this together. So I put a very unfriendly picture up here. Uh, so we're not uh, coming here to rape and pillage, uh, but we are actually the friendly Vikings, uh, which I'll also touch uh, upon. So uh, most of you, probably all of you, know where Stavanger is, but just uh, for the viewers out there who might not know, we are on the northern edge of Europe. Uh, we are uh, just by the coastline of, uh, of Norway, and we are also the oil capital of Norway. And I'm not saying that as a very positive thing these days, but still that's where the money came from. Uh, we've been through... Uh, journey uh, adapting to change. So we've, we've had the need to change several times throughout history. Uh, industrial change, uh, moving on to our current uh, paradigm with, with the oil and gas, but of course, yet uh, uh, again, we need to change. We can't continue this. this it's not sustainable, right? Uh, but we also had another type of journey. We've been uh, working our way through different types of collaborations, different types of projects. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to be, uh, have been part of all of them, at least within uh, these fields. So we started very early working on various concepts of, of letting elderly people li live longer at home. So health and welfare technology. Uh, we started around 20, I would say 12, 13, to look into the smart city concept. It was quite new and it wasn't really, uh, nobody had really decided which direction it should take. Uh, but uh, we joined uh, into a European project as a lighthouse uh, city uh, in the Project Triangulum together with Prague. Uh, and we learned a lot. And this was for the first time uh, sort of the, when, when smart city got on the map in Norway. Uh, we were really proud to be the first city of Norway, also sort of following the dream of the European Union around smart cities. Uh, and it, it grew out of the project, out of the, of the, let's say, the limits of the project, and it became other uh, initiatives, like uh, the Norwegian Smart Care Cluster, which is a way of collaborating around the health and welfare technology. Uh, it became the roadmap uh, of the smart city of Stavanger, and I'll get back to that in a moment. And it became the Nordic Edge Smart City Cluster, 
which is uh, also related to the uh, Nordic Edge conference that you will hear more about uh, later. But all of this we drew out and built on a, out from an EU project and that we built on. So uh, we ended up with this smart city roadmap. At that time when this uh, smart city roadmap was being developed, I was working in the local or the regional multi-utility company, Lyse, energy company and fiber uh, distributor. Uh, and I was asked, can you contribute? Can you t uh, tell us what you need from a smart city? And I did from my perspective at that time. Uh, I, I truly never knew that I was going to lead the whole uh, uh, thing from Stavanger uh, later. But uh, it was co-developed. It was a joint initiative. Uh, it was open. It included uh, academia. It included the industry. And, we, and it included the citizens. And we made the roadmap together. Uh, it achieved uh, something magical, broad political support. Uh, I was kind of surprised myself, but actually this was something that all the political parties said, this is the direction for the future. This is one of those tools we need to break down the barriers to work together and solve the future problems. And it had something very unique. It had a regional perspective. And that is not very common when you look at uh, local policies in Norway. Uh, I'm guessing it's not common elsewhere either. But what it actually meant, and what I've been using this for, because I ended up having this as my work description, I, I'm using this so I can actually move into other neighboring cities, other towns, other municipalities, and I can work together with them, I can test, uh, it could be technology, it could be ways of working, and if it's a success, we scale it back into Stavanger. If it's not a success, we stop it there, and we don't take a larger risk and do it uh, again in Stavanger. It's a perfect cooperation, and the cities around us love it. It's a way of reducing risk, and it's a way of doing and, and having your checks and your control of projects within smaller cities which can uh, move much faster than a city like Stavanger. So it's, it's, a, it's a perfect collaboration. And uh, most of the cities appreciate it. And I even have, uh, since I have this political mandate, I can take my personnel and my investment budget into another city, which is quite unique. So I'm not going to go into detail of what, what it means to, to, to be a smart city or what, uh, sort of why we do this, because you all know very well urbanization, uh, demographic changes, and of course the environment, to, to mention a few. In Stavanger, they made this into five priority areas, and I'm, I'm not going to go into detail to, uh, on this either, but uh, if you look at them very briefly, it, it's, it's kind of everything with a municipality. So it was a tall work uh, order, it was solve everything, please solve it now. And it's like, mm, this won't happen, we have to prioritize, we have to have it uh, uh, breaking down. Uh, and we've been, we've been testing various aspects of this, various ways of solving these problems. And I'll get back to that later today and in another presentation. Uh, but we've been through sort of a learning uh, journey. What is uh, most important with this slide is the drivers. Uh, it was decided as part of this uh, um, way of developing the roadmap that we should have three drivers that would be, that should be present in every project. So it, they should have a, a focus on cooperation, and the cooperation could be internally across the silos, the famous silos. It could be together with academia, it could be together with the businesses around us. Uh, but actually it needed to have citizen involvement. So all projects should be either with or at least for the citizens, not for the city administration. Even if it makes our life better, it should, the end goal should be a better uh, life for the citizens. Uh, and then also they should, at least at that stage, it was pointed out, they should contain either new technology or technology used in a new way and better way. Um, I'm talking a lot about Stavanger at the moment, but this is the journey we've been, uh, been in on. Uh, so um, our definition was that a smart city should be based on a citizens' needs and apply new technology to make the city a better place to, to live and work and really reside. But uh, to make this happen, I've been talking a little bit about regional collaboration, but actually we started to scale it very fast. We saw that uh, even if Stavanger is not a big city, it's, it's large in a Norwegian context, uh, we started working with, uh, with the other large cities of Norway. So we have the Norwegian Smart City Network, 
which we have, which we sit in together with Trondheim, together with Oslo, Bergen, uh, Bode, Kristiansand, and so on. We are, we are uh, sort of, it, it used to be exclusive group of the biggest cities. We opened it up and said, everyone is invited. We need the perspectives of the smaller cities. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, it, there was established a smart city research network at the university. Uh, all these things together made, uh, made this into a very exciting journey, and we got a lot of new knowledge. And mixing it up with the private sector, with the various clusters, the businesses, we, we, we got a very good mixture. And for me, it's also important to point out that to solve the, the, the problems of the future, we can't do it alone. I have colleagues that are quite convinced we could hire even more people and try to solve it from a city perspective, but I'm quite sure we have to bring in the private industry and we should not really not compete with the private industry. We should find a way of co collaborating uh, sort of, and, and find some common grounds. And this is why we've been working with the various types of cluster. I just mentioned three there. And uh, very interesting, we have technology in our region from uh, the subsea level, from offshore, from oil and gas industry, which can be uh, transferred onshore, or should at least be able to transfer it onshore. But the problem is the business case. We can't promise uh, the businesses the same amount of, uh, of uh, revenue as they do from oil and gas. So this is our competition, right? And it's also the competition when it comes to uh, attracting the brightest minds, the best uh, skilled workers. Uh, but actually, we see some technology transfer. And one of the examples is the cluster called uh, Vital Infrastructure Arena, which is uh, where they use technology down in tunnels, up on bridges, etc. And obviously, these are things that need to be robust, and they have a lot of technology transfer from the oil and gas. And this is what I'm wishing for in the future. I want to have uh, subsea technology on, on shore, as, just as, as robust uh, things that will work for 10 and 20 and 30 years without all the maintenance. Let's see if we can make this happen. Um, Karina is coming later today to talk about the Nordic Edge uh, cluster and conference, etc. But it, uh, it's important to point out there's a lot of companies involved in this. And it needs to be not a Stavanger or regional initiative, it needs to be a national and Nordic and international initiative. Which brings me to maybe the most important part of this. We also established, after establishing the national network, we established the Nordic network. And it's quite fascinating how we operate. It's based on what we call the Nordic values, but I'm hoping it applies here as well. Uh, we do a lot of collaboration. It's very open. We share, we trust each other. Uh, in, in such a way that if someone from uh, the city of uh, Tampere or the city of Copenhagen goes to a meeting that I can't attend, I feel very confident that they'll come back to me and tell me if there's something I need to know. We share a lot. There is no political competition. It's even easier than on a national level because we don't compete for the same type of funding. But on a Nordic level, and this could very well be on a Nordic or a Norway Prague level, uh, it's so much easier to find uh, things to work on together and maybe, com maybe enter into uh, European uh, projects getting external funding together. Actually, this is, uh, as a practical example, we can sit around the table and we have external funding without having decided who's going to run the project. We can sit around the table and ask who feels comfortable, who has the knowledge, who are ready to take the next project, and people raise their hands. And then we look around and then we, we just agree. Okay, you can take it. This time around, uh, the city of Trondheim will run this project. I know the next time around they'll give it to me. That's a comfortable way of working. So let's see. And we, we kept, I must admit, we kept the politicians away from this one. So it, it, it's also uh, an approach. Uh, there's one other thing to point out with this. Uh, we are trying to be true to the concept that we have on a Norwegian, on a Nordic level, that we copy each other proudly. So if there's a good initiative, a good solution somewhere, we copy it instead of trying to compete with it or remake it or reinvent the wheel. Agile piloting, the cookbook icon you see there, is a way of procuring together with businesses solving the city's problem. We copied it from Helsinki, we call it Quick Test in Stavanger, and we run it now on a national level as a best practice case. So I'm almost at the end of my initial presentation. Uh, all of this has uh, been um, condensed 
aggregated into the diff various roadmaps. So we had the one that was my start, the, the, the Stavanger one, but we also have uh, the national one and we have the Nordic one. And the reason for me pointing this out is that th these are all made available in English. So if you need any inspiration, if you want to see our angle, please download them. I can send them to you. Uh, I would say there's one difference between these three, uh, or maybe two major differences. One is it's about matureness. So they've kind of changed their, uh, the, the Norwegian one has a very different perspective than the Stavanger one. And the Nordic one is now very much more value-based uh, than the sort of technical approach from the Stavanger one. So there has been some development. And I'll talk more about that uh, later today. I'm not gonna go into detail to, uh, of the various roadmaps, but uh, I think I'm actually going to stop there. This is a, like a journey presentation from Stavanger into a Norwegian and Nordic perspective, but I really hope that we can uh, join forces on some common projects uh, for the future. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's go uh, from uh, Norway to Prague and uh, look at uh, what concepts does Prague have in terms of smart city development for the future? I would like to welcome here Jan Czerny, uh, who is the head of smart city and innovation department in Operator uh, ICT, talking about smart concepts. Hansa, please. So, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me well, uh, either here or online. Uh, my name is Jan Czerny, and I'm head of uh, Smart City and uh, Innovations Department uh, at the Operator ICT company. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about our uh, vision, uh, our uh, like our smart city, or how we do uh, the smart city projects or smart Prague concept in Prague. Yeah, it, it's working, good. Uh, Operator ICT is 100% uh, owned by uh, the city of Prague, and uh, we have uh, several departments, uh, not just the smart city department, but also the other departments that take care of uh, the smart city projects and uh, making uh, Prague better uh, and the future of the Prague better for uh, the citizens. Our motto is uh, that uh, we build a technological future for the better life in Prague, and also, like uh, we uh, do uh, care about uh, the citizens, and also we do care uh, about the city. So we're trying to do uh, the best for for all of us. Uh, department of the smart city is just one of them. The other one, uh, we, uh, we have the ICT projects. We have the data platform that uh, our colleagues uh, mentioned here before, and uh, they will talk about it later too. Uh, we have also uh, the mobile applications, the regional transport system, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I'm going to focus on the smart city. Uh, our mission, uh, or smart city, started in, uh, in Prague uh, in 2016. In 2017, uh, we had the, the concept, smart city or smart Prague 2030. Uh, that is uh, the document where we create the vision and uh, the way how we wanna, or the, in 2030, uh, we want to be somewhere, and this document is gonna tell us how we get there, but uh, it's the, just the future uh, picture of, uh, of the smart city, and not uh, the, the way how we get there to, to the final station. So this is the reason why uh, we started to work on the action plan to 2030, and the strategy, and basically, Smart Prague or the Smart City is not just about Operator ICT, but uh, also about the other uh, companies, either owned by uh, the city of Prague or uh, the private companies, the academic sector, uh, the schools, universities, etc. So all of us, uh, we have to work together and uh, put the, the projects and update the projects somewhere. And uh, the place where uh, we are updating the projects is the, the action plan 2030. And uh, every year we update this uh, this plan and see how it goes and where we're going and if we are on the right path to uh, to our goal that we settled in uh, in the Smart Prague concept 2030. 
also, uh, every year, uh, this is the fourth year of uh, the Smart Prague Index book or the yearbook, where uh, you can see all the information uh, from the yearbooks of, uh, of the other companies. So basically, if you want to uh, find uh, uh, any ind indicators uh, from the whole Prague, you can find it here at the Smart Prague Index. Unfortunately, we wanted to bring it here, uh, the new uh, uh, the new edition, uh, our fourth edition in English, but uh, we have it just uh, online, so just please follow uh, our websites and download it there. Uh, because it's the fourth year, we can now uh, see uh, the, uh, the, the progress uh, where we were in 2017 and where we are now. And also, we are going to try uh, to to work for uh, for another years or next year. We're going to uh, start working on uh, the new one. And uh, the thing why I'm talking about is this: uh, that you can uh, nicely see the progress of the indicators we uh, we chose. Let's say uh, the the electric vehicles, you can nicely see uh, the progress, or the EV chargers, you can see there as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, smart product concept is not just about the operator ICT, uh, but also about uh, the other companies, the private companies, the, the municipal companies, and uh, we are, let's say, in the middle because we are trying to uh, put them all together and try them uh, or uh, convince them that uh, it's necessary to share the information and uh, have it somewhere. Uh, together and work together to make uh, the, the city of Prague better. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the vision of Smart Prague 2030 uh, is uh, not just about the operator ICT, but now I'm going to talk about uh, our uh, point of view and uh, how we are doing the smart city projects. Uh, we divide uh, projects into six uh, areas, as you can see behind me. And uh, we do uh, most of them, or we do pilot projects, most of it. Uh, why we're doing the pilot projects? Uh, I heard, or I heard uh, before that uh, something is good, uh, let's say abroad or in Barcelona. So let's bring it here. And this concept was uh, like, let's say 50% good, but not uh, something that we want to do uh, in a big scale. So that's the reason why we're doing uh, pilots. And uh, we took the idea from, uh, from abroad, uh, tested for 12 months in the conditions of our city, because uh, something is, maybe something is good in, uh, let's say in Barcelona or in Madrid or somewhere else, but it doesn't have to really mean that it's gonna work in Prague as well. So that's the reason why uh, we're testing uh, this solution or uh, this smart city project, let's say, uh, from abroad. And uh, after 12 months, uh, we uh, make the final uh, report and uh, put all the information that we gained uh, together and all the results. And then uh, we decide whether we want to uh, expand and uh, get the, the wider scale or we just uh, end this project because uh, it wasn't like good in our conditions. Uh, mobility of the future. My coworker is gonna work. Uh, is gonna talk about the the, the projects here later. But basically, uh, it's uh, about the EVs, about the uh, the sustainability. Uh, it's about the parking also. Uh, it's about uh, the uh, the payment for uh, the parking, the car sharing, and etc. Smart buildings and, ener and energy. Uh, of course, I don't have to mention we have the climate plan and. Uh, a lot of buildings in uh, in Prague is old, and it's like from uh, 15th century, 16th century, and basically uh, they are not so efficient, uh, like from the energy uh, point of view. So we're trying to do some adjustments for uh, these buildings and make those buildings uh, better uh, from uh, from the energy uh, point of view and. Uh, to be honest, with just little steps or little things, we can. Uh, improve the old building and make it more uh, energy efficient. So this is uh, the second area that we take care of. Uh, the tourism, I don't really have to like uh, uh, introduce this, but uh, also we want 
when is the regular season, we want to make the tourists uh, stay here nicer. So let's say we have uh, one uh, one ticket or one card to make uh, the uh, the visitors in Prague here to travel to to visit uh, some uh, some theaters and some uh, some attractive places. Uh, Waste Free City uh, is uh, another important um, area. Uh, I'm gonna talk about briefly about uh, one project that uh, succeeded, let's say, in the in the pilot project, and we are extending it now uh, to the wider scale. And it's the the sensors uh, in the containers uh, for uh, for the recycle uh, or recycle bins that uh, we have under uh, under the the ground, and they're uh, big bins, and we put the sensors there to see how fill or how full the the containers are, and then we uh, put the data to or we collected the data and then we put them uh, to the data platform and show to uh, the waste companies and to the city of Prague how can they like change uh, the frequencies and everything, and uh, it's a really successful uh, project. Uh, the data field, uh, as I uh, mentioned before, and maybe I show you this picture. Let's say all the the projects um, we're collecting data and we put them in a data platform. Let's say it's the heart of uh, of our uh, smart city concept, and uh, because city of Prague wants to uh, or want to decide uh, based on data, not just because someone said. So that's the reason why we're also doing the, the pilots, get the data, and then uh, get uh, the information. I skip one slide. Here, uh, I mentioned the, the projects, but here uh, you can see a few of them. Uh, the, the, the uh, let's say, our headlines are the most important uh, projects that we, uh, we are just doing. Uh, these uh, are the dashboards from uh, from the Golemio. I just have it here uh, briefly because uh, my coworker Ben Kotma is gonna talk about it later and show you more pictures. But uh, if you can see uh, the first one on the left, uh, it's the dashboard where uh, we were uh, looking uh, on the data from uh, from the waste bins and were able to decide on those data. I have an, an idea platform. Uh, sorry, I just need to drink. Sorry about that. Uh, this platform, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we get the ideas from abroad, and not just abro from abroad, but uh, also uh, from the citizens. Uh, this platform, uh, everyone has a chance when they get the idea uh, to let us know that uh, they uh, want to improve something, they have this, this idea, and uh, they just fulfill uh, the, the form, and we get the idea. Uh, of course, some of the ideas, they're just testing uh, if the form is working, so those ideas are uh, not legible to, uh, you know, to live. But a uh, few of them are uh, really good, and then uh, we take care of them. And uh, we, some of them, if uh, we, we send them to uh, the academic uh, experts and uh, other experts to, uh, to make the, if, if the work, uh, if the work, if the project is gonna be uh, livable, and then uh, we transform this idea to, to the real project. Prague City Portal, just briefly. Uh, we live in the in the in the time when uh, you are not able to go, uh, let's say, uh, to the to the city, to uh, to the offices, to everywhere, and uh, we're trying to make the life still like easy for uh, for the citizens. So this is the reason why uh, we bring the the Prague Citizen Portal where you can uh, send uh, any kind of uh, permits or uh, the, uh, some registrations or uh, some, uh, some electronic submissions online. You don't have to go anywhere and you just apply on this platform and uh, you can do uh, this from, from your home. Pragozor, as I mentioned, Smart City Index. Uh, Smart City Index is a big yearbook, uh, and not for all the people is good to read uh, 160 pages. 
So uh, Pragozor is the easier way how you can read the data and uh, understand the data uh, that uh, we have here in Prague. So you can visit uh, Pragozor and uh, get the, the information uh, briefly. Here also, uh, all the projects, uh, you can find it on, uh, on the website, the smartprog.eu uh, slash projects. So uh, it's also in English, so just please free uh, to visit and, uh, and see the projects that you are doing. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, I'm really looking forward to our uh, later debate on the current state of smart city development in Prague. Thank you, Honza, once again. Um, so the next topic, uh, going uh, back to Norway, uh, it's good how we are changing Prague and Norway. I think we can uh, make a, a nice, uh, nice comparison throughout the day. Um, I would like to welcome here, and I suppose it's going to be an online presentation, uh, Anita Lindal Trotsdal, uh, who is a uh, project manager of Oslo European Green Capital 2019. Uh, I think uh, it's a great thing to, to, uh, to have um, Anita here um, and to maybe listen to see how, how to become a green capital of Europe. Anita, welcome. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and, and good morning uh, to everyone here from Oslo. Uh, if I want to start on a positive note, I can say that this is the first day that we have snow. So uh, most Norwegians are actually quite happy about that. Uh, on a negative note, we also have the highest uh, record on, uh, on COVID cases in the city of Oslo. So we do not expect to get exactly the winter that we perhaps hoped for. But I guess that's the situation uh, all over Europe. So uh, that was my... <laughs> <laughs> introduction to, to the day today. Um, my name is then Anita Lindal Trusa. I'm, I was the project manager for Oslo as European Green Capital in 2019. I'm now in the office of the governing mayor uh, as a chief advisor in the international office working on European affairs. Um, I heard about the smart city concepts from my, my previous speakers here and, and my uh, perspective is a little bit different, although we also work uh, on sustainability with the, the aim, of course, of, of working smarter and bringing in new solutions, using all the data that we can gather uh, to actually uh, reach our targets. Uh, I don't know if you know a lot about the European Green Capital title, but this is the title that Oslo got from the European Commission. We were assessed on, on 12 different uh, environmental indicators, uh, it covered climate action and I receive it. Uh, and I think, like the previous speakers, this is not uh, an award for, for the city administration, although we quite uh, appreciate it. It's, it's more uh, an award that recognizes the effort that has been done uh, from the city, but also from the public and the companies, universities, etc., over a long period of time. So I think that we have been lucky in Oslo to have a very long-term uh, political commitment and also uh, strategies that support uh, the development uh, in Oslo. I will try now to share my uh, screen with you and hopefully this will work and, and I'll uh, start actually with uh, the long-term perspective because so, everyone uh, here uh, that works in, in urban development in some way or another knows that this is, this is a transformation of a city takes time. Uh, and uh, this has been a long process for Oslo and it's still uh, ongoing. And on the left-hand side, you can see how the city was uh, focused on, on car, on, on industry and harbour activities. Uh, and uh, the top uh, picture is actually of our city hall and, uh, and uh, the bottom ones are, are uh, illustrating the industrial and harbour activities that has been uh, the traditional path of, of our um, city. But as you can also see that these activities cut the city and the citizens off from the, the full waterfront. So um, big changes have been made. So in the 1990s, early 1990, uh, um, the traffic that you see, there was the eight line, lane highway across the city hall square has been put in a tunnel and all the traffic then has been diverted from the city center, making uh, room for pedestrians, uh, cyclists, green public space. And also a second major transformation that has led up to where we are today is the conversion of this uh, former industrial harbor uh, area. So the full length of our waterfront, now about 
10, 11 kilometers has now been converted into what you can see on the bottom right hand side, a uh, combination of, of commercial residence, cultural, uh, rec recreational areas. Uh, so this is just to give you a glimpse of perhaps a development that led to, to the green capital title. Uh, I will not be able to cover all areas today. I will focus mainly on our climate policies and how we try to think smarter and innovate to reach these goals. And I will take part in the panel discussion later if, if you want to, to uh, ask about other uh, issues. So I will uh, start with the big issue, of course, for us all is how to reach the targets in the Paris Agreement. We have a very ambitious climate strategy in Oslo in line with the Paris Agreement, but that leaves us few years uh, to reach our target of 95% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, which is really uh, ambitious steps. Um, in addition to this target, we also have targets on, on uh, increasing the carbon sinks. We have a large forest in our um, municipality and also other green areas that we'd like to, to work with to, to uh, improve the carbon um, uh, capture, you can say. Uh, we also want to reduce our energy consumption and uh, make the city more climate resilient. And the fifth one is also quite a difficult one, but we want to reduce the carbon footprint on the, uh, of the city as such, which means that we also want to somehow address uh, the indirect uh, emissions from all the things that we buy and purchase that uh, are produced elsewhere. I will mainly focus on the first point today, but I wanted to show you that our climate strategy tries to be also holistic um, to improve our city situation as a whole. Um, if you see this graph, you can see our main uh, challenges when it comes to, to reaching uh, emissions. Um, you see our, our target is actually 95% reduction and the, the dotted lines are showing the projections of uh, all the current policies in place. So you see that we still have a large gap uh, and we need more forceful, forceful policies. Uh, and we need to be innovative in, in how uh, we implement these to be able to actually get closer to our uh, goal. You can also see the three main uh, areas where we have challenges. It's the, low, the yellow one is, is construction and non-road machinery. I'll get back to that. Uh, the blue one is our waste incineration plant, where we have a plan uh, to introduce carbon capture on the plant and to store it then uh, uh, in the North Sea. Uh, but this is dependent on, on external financing. I'll get back to this as well. And then our big uh, challenge is the, the transport sector, as you see. Um, I will also uh, talk more about this. But it's a complicated uh, picture, um, but uh, we are working uh, as fast as we can uh, to solve this. And one thing that we think is quite innovative and that is easily transferable is that we try to uh, use the data that we have and uh, operationalize our climate strategy into a climate budget. So for us, this is a budget, is a tool to somehow operationalize per year uh, the, the climate strategy and it's integrated into the ordinary municipal budget. So it's actually the Department of Finance that is in control of all of the climate budget. It identifies all the emission reduction measures that we are, are in place and how much uh, they are um, then uh, estimated to cut of emissions. It identifies also uh, the cost and which unit is responsible for its implementation. And this is important because this is not just up to the vice mayor of environment and transport, it's for the whole city government to uh, be able to deliver on, on uh, the uh, cuts that we need uh, in terms of emissions. And the reporting is also a part of the ordinary budget cycle. So we're actually working now with Norwegian municipalities uh, to develop a model that can be used and transferred to other uh, municipalities in Norway. And a manual has been uh, developed for this, this also is available in English um, for, you, for you to be able to access. And we're also part of international networks in trying to uh, work out ways how this can be a methodology that can use, be used in cities in all parts of the world. So we're actually in a climate network for big cities called C40, where we have now big cities such as Los Angeles, Mumbai, London, Paris, working to um, along the lines of our thoughts on climate budget to introduce this in their cities. Uh, so this is 
something we think we can use, we need to use uh, this data to be able to uh, better reach our goals. And also uh, we need uh, partners. Cooperation is, is key. Uh, we therefore work with different uh, stakeholders, business community, universities in different ways. Here you can see an image from the Business for Climate Network, which is one platform that we use. But we also use public procurement as a tool to create and support investment in green uh, solutions. And we also use um, joint innovation projects. So this Business for Climate Network is a network for companies that sign up on a climate pact with the city. And it's an arena for dialogue where we can inform the companies on, on policy developments. They can give us input. Uh, we can uh, better support each other in, in the work we all uh, agree on, which is to develop a city that is smarter and better and has a lower carbon footprint. Uh, we also work or put uh, demands on the public sector, or private sector, sorry, in our uh, procurement policy. Uh, so uh, this is, I think, one of our most important tools as we procure for, I think, it's something in the region of 40 billion Norwegian kroner every year, which is a big investment budget. Um, so uh, we uh, put criteria then on on uh, environmental criteria and, and emissions criteria, and also life cycle criteria in our procurement, which can then push the market into the direction that we want uh, and help us uh, minimize our carbon footprint. I will give an example of this later on. Um, we also work in innovation projects. Uh, for example, we recently uh, started a new uh, EU Lighthouse project on smart mobility called Move 21, where we actually are looking at how we can organize uh, our uh, mobility better and, and look if, uh, into possibilities of perhaps combining the planning of passenger mobility and also of city logistics. Um, so different methods of working with other stakeholders, I think, is really important for us. Uh, has been and will be even more important in the future. And as you saw on the graph, the mobility sector, transport sector, is really what we need to uh, tackle if we are to to reach um, our uh, climate goals. And as most cities, uh, we we wish to reduce the car traffic while at the same time strengthening public transportation and to better um, uh, develop a better city for pedestrians and cyclists. So that's our, our main priority. Uh, and we see that walking is also is a very walkable city. So a lot of people walk already, uh, but during the pandemic, the cycling has uh, improved a lot. But we have started working also to speed up the investments in bicycle infrastructure. And we are very curious to see how this will continue after the, the pandemic. Um, we've had a very good uh, um, public transport system and very high numbers in increased uh, commuters. Uh, but this is a negative trend, I guess, uh, with the pandemic, that uh, there's less uh, use of the public transport system when we now see uh, uh, issues with financing uh, the system as it is. So we are also very um, attentive to, to what will happen with the, our um, public transport system after the pandemic. But this is really a backbone of our green mobility uh, strategy. So we hope that we can recreate the trust in public transport uh, as we go along. Uh, and the public transport is quite green already. We have both trams and uh, the metro, which are running on uh, green electricity from hydropower. Uh, so it's really the buses that we need to convert. Uh, we've started already in our green capital year. Uh, we had 115 electric buses introduced into the system. Uh, and three ferries were converted to, to electricity, three large passenger ferries. And another 100 buses will be introduced in January uh, 2022. And we hope to have the entire fleet, about 1,200 plus buses, uh, converted by 2028. So this is uh, ongoing uh, work. And when we try to reduce uh, the number of cars, as I said, we want to make it a little bit more inconvenient to use your car. You have to pay in a toll ring to enter the city. Uh, the prices of parking, you would probably say, is quite high. Um, we would, of course, then like the remaining uh, car fleet uh, to be electric or zero emission. Uh, and I will get back to that a little bit later in, in the program, but this is a sort of priority. But we do not prioritize electricity before all the other modes of transport. Uh, I can also talk more about that later. 
And what we were happy to see uh, starting in the green capital year is that the business community uh, are very eager to adapt to change in policy or actually um, policies that are not even uh, introduced yet. We have reduced the access of cars in the city and we've also launched uh, plans to, to introduce a low emission or zero emission zone in the city centre. So the community, business community is already adapting. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see these uh, cycling uh, lorries, as we call them. And I know that in, in the city of Prague, you also have uh, city depots where, where uh, the, the cyclists do the last mile uh, delivery. Because I saw on the EuroCities Awards, you were one of the nominees with this project. Um, and on the left hand side, it's the beloved city concept where um, two different uh, companies have teamed up. Um, it's a company that delivers packages and a company that collects waste from offices uh, in the same area. So the city will go out bringing packages and bring dry waste back. So instead of having two uh, vans operating in the same area, you have one going out full packages coming back full of dry waste. So this is also smart ways of, of just organizing your city logistics and having different companies teaming up. Uh, in anticipation of policies that are, are implemented by the city. Uh, I would uh, like them to spend a little bit of time on these electric uh, big machinery. Uh, we saw uh, in our data that the numbers uh, vary a little bit from year to year, but up to 20% of our emissions actually come from, from uh, construction machinery and non-road machinery. And there's a lot of building uh, going on. We're a growing city. So we really wanted to tackle this, uh, this source of emission. And we see that there's been little innovation in this type of machinery. So we started in 2016 to demand fossil free construction machinery on, on our public builds. Uh, and we've progressed on this. And uh, now we also ask for fossil free or zero emission when possible in our public tenders. And we've had some pilots on smaller projects that were fully zero emission, uh, and uh, we see that the market is responding quite rapidly. In 2019, we had one electric digger in, in Oslo. This year, I've heard that we, there are about 100, and the, the companies expect the numbers to go up to 250 already next year. So there's a great shift when the market first starts to move. So here as well, we want to cooperate in Europe and also internationally to really push for a greater market for these type of um, electric machinery so that the entrepreneurs also can trust that they can use uh, these in more than one project. And here as well, we're working uh, in new projects, but also uh, within the framework of C40 to get uh, a global attraction to this, uh, this topic. So I think this is also how we can use our powers uh, in the public sector to, to actually develop a market if we work smart and if we work together. Uh, waste treatment uh, is, is, of course, uh, important. Uh, we, of course, sort our waste at home. We recycle food waste into bioenergy, we recycle the plastic, the, the, the glass, metal, paper, etc. Um, but we also see that we will have some residual waste and we use this to uh, feed into our district heating system and also to produce energy. But our challenge in terms of emissions is that uh, this accounts for a lot of our emissions. Uh, the numbers vary here as well. The latest number was 23% of our emissions comes from actually uh, the incineration of our waste. So if we are to reach our target of 95% uh, reduction in, in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we need to tackle this. Um, we have tested quite successfully carbon capture at this uh, waste treatment plant. And we are looking now to install the full uh, operation on the plant. Uh, but this is uh, as of yet quite expensive technology and we are dependent on external financing to, to achieve it. And we recently, just last week, I think, got a negative reply from the European Innovation Fund. So now we have to look for, for alternatives uh, on this. But the technology is ready and we have very good test results. And we are confident that somehow we will manage to, to develop this technology um, also on our waste treatment uh, plant. I also wanted to end with one project on climate adaptation, which was also one of the projects that the European Commission 
pointed to when we were Anita, appointed. Anita, sorry, yeah? we, are, we are running out of time, so we have like about okay. a minute to, to land, so okay. thank you. Uh, I will skip the reopening of rivers, but you can read about it later, and I will end with the citizens engagement part. This was a key factor in the European Green Capital. We had a lot of partners and uh, events all over the city. We see that it's easier to, to convert the young and children, but it's all the more uh, difficult for the older generation. So really the key is, is to make the green choice the most uh, convenient choice. And then you will get the action, even though people are not actually convinced they would do what is most convenient to them. So I will end with that. And uh, please uh, feel free to, to contact me uh, should you have any, any questions on, on details. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Anita, we will have a chance to ask questions during the debate. Uh, uh, our Slido is active, so feel free uh, on hashtag sharing future. You can ask questions and we will address them further on. Uh, thank you again. And uh, our next um, speaker, uh, again, uh, comes from Prague, operator ICT. Uh, Benedict Kotsmal, head of platform data department, will be talking about open data. Please. And I see Iri on Zoom. I don't know if he's going to be joining us, uh, but he's going to be joining us later on, right, during the debate. Hi, everybody. Is it working? Ah, yes. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're not too tired of innovation and sharing and sustainability and smart city and everything because i have another amazing story i want to share it's uh, it's it is going to be not about open data but about our data platform i think this conference was supposed to happen one and a half year ago and we had to postpone it due to COVID. a lot of change since then but the topic stayed the same uh, i forgot to make a uh, new topic. So I'm going to share a story about Praxis Data Platform and I'm going to talk about open data as well. What, what, what role open data and open source played in, in creating the data platform. So first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Benedict Kotmel. I'm head of the data platform department. Uh, I, uh, I have been working for four years now uh, on this project. Before that, I used to work at the Ministry of Finance uh, I, as an open data project manager, and I was responsible for first governmental open data platforms uh, in the Czech Republic. So my background is, is in open data, open data project management, and open data community engagement, especially. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to share a story how, what, what we, uh, how we went from nothing to, uh, to this. So first of all, let me introduce what we're doing right now. This is some; th those are some screenshots from our data platform, some dashboards, data analytics, real-time data visualization. My colleague uh, Jan Czerny uh, already mentioned something. So right now, uh, we are integrating uh, more than uh, more than uh, it's like hundreds of data sets, and we are creating more than hundreds, hundred of real-time data dashboards that are provided to the city decision makers. And you can see some of those. We, it doesn't, yeah, it works. So we work with transportation. We in, were integrating data, real-time data from waste, from public transportation, energy consumption, bicycling, um, cycling, energy, energy consumption, waste management, housing, city environment, of course, COVID, vaccination and everything. So we have around 100 data dashboards maintained in real time provided to, to the city 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 decision makers uh, this is uh, this is pragozor it's a publicly available web portal for publishing everything as open data but we st strongly felt that we had to create something uh, that everybody can consume uh, that ev that every person can understand so we created this pragozor it's uh, it's a really simple visualization visualization of a lot of data we had in our data platform. So you can take a look at the pragozor.cz and you will see all the visualizations there. It's publicly available. available. And this is one of our most, uh, most successful project. It's a COVID portal. It's not COVID data visualization portal. It's data service uh, that, uh, that can anybody, everybody used for finding a place to be tested for COVID. 
Uh, it seems really easy. It, it's not easy solution. It looks really easy, but it's not easy because we had to integrate, I think, around 50 different, 50 different websites to one because there is like many providers of, of uh, COVID testing places and we had to integrate all of them to one place. And I think this, is, this, uh, uh, this website visited around 9,000, uh, 900,000 unique, uh, unique IP addresses, which is around, I would say, like 700,000 uh, people in the city of Prague, which is nearly half of the Prague. It's more than half of the Prague. Uh, and it's really, it's really super cool because you can find a testing place within one minute. And before that, it took like from 10 to 15 minutes to find a testing point that is available for the, for the date you want. Uh, I already talked about it. Uh, we have around one, 100 data dashboards and we've been part of uh, 90 plus digitalization project in the city of Prague. Very often we don't deliver just data analytics and uh, data analytics and data dashboards. Very often we deliver only consulting, which is a very important part of our job, explaining how data works. And very often we have to explain what's not in the data, what project isn't good, uh, what we shouldn't do before we even start it. And this is uh, some visualization of our data platform. So what is important is that we have three, uh, three outputs. One of them is business intelligence and reporting. The other one is client dashboards. You saw that uh, in the screenshot. And the third one is open data and open API, which is really important for us as well. Uh, but if you would ask me what is data platform in City of Prague, I would always say it's really good combination of people and technology. Uh, we have we have around 15 people as data developers, uh, consultant, consultants, and data analysts, and we have amazing piece of technology we used for all of those services. Uh, and uh, and I, I would like to share something, uh, uh, something about our uh, technology solution. I know that this is not technological conference, but I think the the solution we used we come up with. Uh, it really reflects the development of the project and the development of how we, how we think about data and open data in the city of Prague. So for us, firstly, it is more important that open data for us is open source. And I will get to it later. Uh, so a little bit of history. We started at September 2017. That's, uh, that's, that, that, that is when I came uh, to the operat operator ICT. And we had this first kickoff meeting. And back then, in 2017 and 2016, uh, there was a huge political support and very generous funding on smart city solutions. And there was this project data platform. And it was very simple. It was about like, there's a money, there's a huge funding. There is an idea of having data platform uh, that will integrate all of those smart city solutions. And yeah, that's it. Just please do it. <laughs> and that was the beginning. I had to, and uh, I, very, very fast, I reali realized that I really didn't, didn't have a clue what to do. So yeah, but we had big funding. We had big, po big political support and everything. But we have to come up with the idea what to do with data. Uh, so w what is it, the data platform? It's about data integration. It's about data analytics. It's about building, building uh, some, some super fast cloud solution that will calculate everything, machine learning, AI, we didn't have anything. But in January 2018, like I, th I think five, five months later, we decided, we, we purchased some data platform. Uh, it's a product from Cisco, Cisco Kinetics for Cities platform. We launched it in January 2018. And, and very fast, we realized that, that it is not a good solution. It was a box solution for city data integration and visualization and it wasn't it wasn't really good so we decided that we have to launch our data platform and that we have to create our own software solution uh, internally developed and maintained by operator ICT and we did it at o October 2019 we also published it as open source it's open source you can download it download it you can take a look at it on github at in January 2020 we started to provide the data services, data dashboards, and analytics on this new platform. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk, uh, talk, talk for a while about software solution, and I like to think of it in a, in a, in a for me personally, looking at the data and getting the value from it, understand the problems, it's like listen to music. So if you want to listen to music, you need something, you need some, uh, you need some hardware to listen to music, and um, you can, for example, purchase a phonograph, and you listen to music, and you think, okay, this is nice, I'm getting the idea, I'm getting everything from the music, but uh, after a while, if you want to dig deeper, if you want to listen to something more complicated, more nice and better, you can purchase bigger phonograph as well. But after a while, if you really, if you want to uh, listen to some very specific music uh, that is not available anywhere, you just come up with the idea that you need to, uh, you need to form a band, you need to start a band with various instruments. And that's what we did actually. So we decided that we need to have a band, we, knew that we need to have a band with people who understand all of the technology, all of the data, and who can control the technology. And that's when we came up with this solution. Uh, this is very technical, it's architecture of our data platform, but the most important thing is that it's a modular system. Uh, it's a it's com combination of different software packages that we de develop or on our own, or we use open source solutions. The most important one is integration engine, and, and message broker and uh, databases, but it allows us to scale to anywhere we want. That is the most important thing because very often there is, uh, there is uh, demand on very specific data design solutions. For example, sometimes our clients want, the city, city stakeholders want some, some API, very often they want CSV file delivered to be on daily basis uh, through mail, very often they want business intelligence, like uh, da daily updated data dashboards, very often they want uh, some kind of uh, data visualization, map visualization, and very often there is a really complicated uh, ATL system behind it, uh, very often it's integration of tens of data sets uh, and connecting to one data set. So, that's why we need this solution. So we made up this solution and it's really scalable and it allows us to do agile development, which is really important for us. It is the most important thing uh, because data platform, it's not a project, it's a product. And the difference between product and project is that we actually, we're, we don't know what's going to happen within the next two years. We can define what we want to do, but every time, uh, it can change uh, for to something else, so that's why we strongly focus on agile development, and uh, it's really important. And it allows us to do prototyping and iterative approach. I think uh, the colleague was talking about it earlier. We first of every project, every data project starts with a prototype in our data platform. It is really important, and. What is, uh, I forgot to mention the open data. Uh, what is the data platform actually, it's a software solution, it's a, it's a bunch of people, really clever uh, data analysts, data developers, uh, consultants, project managements. But data platform is about communication. That's basically what we do. We, we are enabling the communication between data stakeholders and uh, client and decision makers and citizens. So data platform is about communication. And when it comes to communication, uh, the open data is the openness, gener generally the openness, not only open data, but also open source, but also, also open way of how we operate is really important. Because when you have open data, you don't understand what's behind it. You don't un if you have open data, you don't understand, uh, you don't understand the domain for example, if you would download any of our data, and we are publishing most of it through open API in real time, but if you download it and trying to understand it, it will, it will take you months since you come up with, since you come with any, any kind of solution. That's what we do, we are doing end-to-end -end data solutions. And if you want to do that, it will take a huge amount of time. 
if you don't understand the domain. So we're trying to explain everything we do, not only data, not only publishing open data and open source, but also explaining what we're doing, how does it work, why we didn't come up with this solution, but we come up with this solution. So it is really important. So open data and uh, open data and open source and open communication is the most important part of our job. And that is that. Ah, okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much and hopefully see you later here. Thank you, thank you, Benedict, thank you. Um, uh, let's move on. Um, uh, there, again, there will be time to, to address uh, um, uh, the uh, ICT platform and data platform uh, um, later on uh, during our uh, debate, uh, our next uh, guests. Uh, uh, um, Agatha Krause, Head of 2030 Agenda and International Relations at the Center for Sustainable Development in Trondheim City. Let's see another great case of, uh, of the city that actually uh, has a great plan for sustainable, innovative future. Agatha, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, colleagues. Fantastic to see you. Fantastic to be here. Um, so I'm Agata Krauser. I work for the Center for Sustainable Development of Trondheim Kommune. So yes, we do have a Center for Sustainable Development. And yes, we are trying to break the silos, be horizontal, and really try to develop innovation and feed this innovation into the work of the commune, but also at various all levels of governance. So I, the reason why I'm here, the reason I'm doing this job, because I've worked over the last few years at the local global interface. I worked on not only developing innovation, SDG innovation, so innovation for sustainable development goals, but I was also working on advocacy and trying to make sure that the policymakers at the global level and European level are able to capture the excellence taking place at the local level. And the same type of work I'm doing in Trondheim Commune. So um, I'm not sure if I can managed to make it work? Um, yes, indeed. So, first of all, I will introduce you to the context of Trondheim. I will tell you a little bit about how we work with innovation, um, why we are the UN Geneva Charter Center of Excellence on SDG City Transition. Then I will position what I heard today from all of you. So I heard a lot about open data, open data platforms, open source, innovation development. Okay. But for us in Trondheim, it's important to position that in the wider context, in the context of ambition, in the context of a transition. And I will explain to you how we are doing that and why we see huge value in this specific positioning. So I will talk about sustainable value creation, a systematic approach to smart and sustainable cities. I've worked at the smartness and sustainability interface over last couple of years as well, before I was working for United Nations institutions on smart, sustainable cities. So this interface is very clear to me, it's very important, and I will hopefully will try to convince you about how to operationalize this interface and how to change people's mind, hearts and minds in order to deliver smart and sustainable cities. So Trondheim, where are we? We are in the central Norway. We are. I would consider what I would consider medium-sized city of 191,000 inhabitants with a pretty good uh, GDP and actually 4.5% 4, 4, 4 of it being spent on research and development, which is a considerable amount if you think about how much other cities in Europe can actually spend on it, um, which is in many instances below 1%. Um, Right, we have very low unemployment rate, 99% of businesses are small and medium enterprises, and we are committed. We are really committed to 2030 agenda, we are really committed to net zero. We are innovation capital. What it means is that I will actually explain that to you in details, how we, um, how we arrived there. But recently we've been titled the third most innovative city in Europe in the category and in our own category. So this is, this is the photo from the award ceremony that took place a couple of days back. But we are also Geneva UN Charter Center of Excellence on SDG City Transition because of our legacy, because of our approach to smart, sustainable cities, among others. And I will tell you a little bit about how it's effectuated. Right. 
So now positioning of what we are doing. For us, as I said, it's important to position the context of ICT infrastructure services, smart investment, and so on and so forth in the wider debate. And really, for us, it's important to use this interface of smartness and sustainability to deliver impact investment. For us, investment in ICTs is not investment in infrastructure and services, it's investment in people, communities, economic development, social development, environmental protection. This is a starting point for discussion, delivering impact investment. It's a narrative and we also walk this talk and I will tell you how, we're going to, uh, how we are doing that. Um, for us, sustainable value creation approach to smart, sustainable cities is actually also based on what has been said so far, which is about open source innovative accounting methods. And I will uh, tell a little bit more about that in a minute. But it's also grounded in mainstreaming SDGs. So we cannot become smarter and more sustainable without thinking seriously about sustainable development. For us, it is a a mantra, a key element of the whole process. So smartness becomes an element in this bigger transitioning towards um, a sustainable future process. And last but not least, we are really strong in supporting ecosystem development. So these are the four pillars of smart sustainable cities that we title sustainable valley creation. And as I said, we walk the talk. So impact investment, what it means is that when we are delivering, pro we're developing and delivering projects, we're really thinking about what type of change we want to induce. And we are building on synergy effects between various elements of urban life and sustainability. For instance, when we are investing in energy, we're investing in climate, we're investing in SDG 11, SDG 13, SDG 8, and so on and so forth. So we are really taking this whole system approach as a starting point for discussion, not as an end point, as a starting point. What type of change we want to deliver? And really, we are working on that, for instance, in the context of positive city exchange project which relies on building energy positive districts while using advanced ICT solutions with a view to become climate neutral so this is the narrative that we are starting with it's not our conclusion it's our starting point Similarly, in, the, in, the, in relation to transport and mobility, for us delivering ICT solution to transport mobility, it's not only about service innovation, but it's about modernization, research and development, improving public health, social mobility, and so, and so on and so forth. So we have the diagram indicating this type of dynamics there. So this is about delivering impact investment. We cannot decouple smartness from sustainability. It has to come together and it has to be a starting point for discussions. Um, I have an example of uh, Mobia, but I will maybe uh, refer to it a little bit later. So indeed, our Positive City Exchange project, as I said, um, it aims to deliver energy positive districts to become, for us to become climate neutral. It builds on synergies between climate, energy, transport, for instance, and urban planning, obviously, in the wider context. So that's, that's our approach. The second pillar of our approach is open source innovative accounting for smart sustainable cities. Again, we are not decoupling smartness and sustainability. We use the methods that allow us to combine these two. For instance, Trondheim, as many other cities in Norway, was evaluated against the key performance indicators for smart sustainable cities, which is United Nations global standard for smart sustainable cities. We went through this process because we value this interface, smartness and sustainability. So these are the outcomes of this evaluation. If you want, I can talk about it bilaterally later. Um, we also, um, sorry, I'm just gonna, maybe I will mention a little bit about the outcomes of the evaluation indeed. It revealed that we have very good access to data overall. But we need to improve model split share, traffic monitoring, intersection control, and the quality of water infrastructure as 30% of water is lost in the water system in the city, which is obviously a huge loss given uh, the importance of preserving natural resources. 
So all of that outcomes of these evaluations are publicly available. The data, the raw data is publicly available and we have a open source data platform when you can access this data. I mentioned this because the fact that we have been able to develop this open approach to such evaluations was really a breaking stone for the mental transition within the commune and its wider context to discuss development challenges. Without opening access to data, we wouldn't be able to um, achieve that. We wouldn't be able to create this common language and to generate discussions that are needed to be generated on the topics which are not easy. If you discover that 30% of the water is lost from your municipal infrastructure system, it is a problem. And it's not easy to discuss through opening access to data. We were able to discuss it and now we are able to address it. So at the same time, we were really trying to, as I said before, improve improve the way we measure things. So we are developing together with Statistics Norway, together with other cities, uh, the taxonomy. So the taxonomy, SDG taxonomy, is the tool that allows to assess the quality of SDG indicator set. So the quality of the way we measure things. We want to measure things in a, in, in a robust way. But how do we know whether the assessment tools we are using are good enough? Are they? So we have the taxonomy that allows us to measure, for instance, as the quality of SDG indicator sets, including the indicator sets that allow assessing both smartness and sustainability. And we are actually drawing on the relationship between various elements of the process while working on SDG ontology as well. So more than this, we really try to be able to visualize this open data in a dynamic manner in order to improve evidence-based policies and decision making. So we are currently developing digital twin city model where we'll be overlaying the data with a 3D city model. We'll be able to zoom in, zoom out, uh, focus on certain elements of infrastructure in the city, transport infrastructure, ICT infrastructure, and so on and so forth, to be able to make decisions more efficiently and faster. That being said, it's obviously not a ready-made solution. We are still testing it. We're still trying to understand its value. So what I told you right now is two things. First of all, we are oriented at impact investment for smart and sustainable cities. Second, I said that, um, that ICT infrastructure and open data is critical in this whole process. But these are two pillars. We have also a couple of more. As I mentioned before, we are really interested in positioning our smartness in the context of SDGs. And we are doing that, we are able to do that because we invest in SDGs in the first place, because we mainstream SDGs across policy areas, because we mainstream SDGs across municipal architecture and operations. We cannot really detangle these two things. So not only we have climate plans and energy plans, which clearly correspond to the 2030 agenda, but we also have municipal master plans, social plan, area plan, which all of have um, all of which correspond to SDGs, all of which we have uh, 2030 agenda at heart. So this element is, is really a fraction, reflection about our readiness to become smarter and more sustainable. And I'm very happy that the word readiness has already occurred, the word maturity. Where are we in our progress towards becoming smart and sustainable? This is the question we are asking ourselves in Trondheim on a daily basis. In the roadmaps are created to be able to position yourselves in the spectrum against your aspiration, to be able to track your progress and to be able to ref reflect on your maturity. So for instance, in Trondheim, we are using SDG City Transition Framework, which is EU, a European Union awarded tool to assess maturity of a city in relation to certain aspect and can be easily easily uh, used in relation to smart cities. So you have this, this image on the right hand side in the corner, various aspects of reflection about city maturity. How can we talk about our aspirations if we are not sure where we are standing? So that's why it's important for us to be able to reflect on that. 
Um, on that aspect, we have, for instance, recently developed also voluntary local review. Um, voluntary lo local review tells about how far we have gone in achieving SDGs, but also it's forward-looking. So the objective of which is to reflect on what we have done good in order to be able to upscale it, replicate it, and to attract all the stakeholders into the process. That is ongoing. And then maybe I will move to the last period. So I mentioned three things before. First, we are oriented at impact investment for smart, sustainable cities, and it's a starting point for discussion. Second, we're using ICT infrastructures, open data platforms, open access to data to be able to not only to create a robust discussions and robust findings that we can use in policies and decision making, but to enable democratic process and deliberation. Thirdly, I also mentioned that we are reflecting on our maturity vis-a-vis -vis the targets and the objectives and aspirations that we have. And we are open about it. And last but not least, we believe that transitioning towards smart and sustainable cities requires ecosystem development. It requires working, as we said before, across sectors, breaking down the buyers, breaking down the silos, also across various levels of governance. And here it's important to say that Trondheim has been very strong and deliberate about working with the university, Norwegian University of Technology and research institution Sintef in order to break the silos, but also in order to deliver and be able to develop innovation at speed. So thanks to this collaboration, we are really able to source the newest, the best available evidence that we need in policy process and decision making. And to be, and thanks to this collaboration, we're able to deliver projects. So as I mentioned, it's not only about collaborating, because we always collaborate with someone on something, but what we achieve through the collaboration. Through the collaboration, we are achieving maturing of the city's ecosystem reinforcing the values outside the municipality on its own with its partners who start valuing smartness and sustainability together. So this is our, this is our mantra, this is how we are doing that. But also specifically my role is to work at the local global interface. So because I was working previously with United Nations, now I'm also responsible to feeding the excellence taking place at the local level to the global level. So we are really also supporting policy making and standard setting processes at the global level. And this is the way we are also supporting this whole system approach across various levels of governance. And we are very pleased to be part of, uh, to be strongly collaborating with uh, Nordic Edge, with Innovation Norway, with the city of Stavanger to reinforce regional approach to collaboration, cooperation that allows the maturing of the whole ecosystem. So I hope that, yes, so uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, we are working with other cities, um, with other cities as well in order to, as I said, mature the, the, the whole regional ecosystem. Yes, uh, so I hope, um, I will mention about that in a moment, I hope by now you have understood that many of the things that have been mentioned so far are essential to position in a deliberate process. That is, in our case, in the case of Toronto, have been successful to upscale this process and to make it a vision for the policymakers as well. So we have a high level support for our vision and we are walking the talk. And we believe that sustainable value creation approach to smart and sustainable cities allow us to combine smartness and sustainability effectively. And not only we work in Trondheim, not only we work at the regional level with excellent partners, but on national level, we also work globally. We are replicating this approach in other countries in the globe. For instance, now we are working in Lebanon in order to reinforce energy transitions in the country. But again, we are not talking about energy transition per se. We are really positioning in the, positioning in the context of sustainability transition in order to ensure that we are able to deliver things efficiently and effectively. So please don't hesitate <laughs> to contact me. Um, I'm very happy to provide you information, further information about our project and processes and everything else. But I think the most important and the, the most delighted I'm talk to you, that I would like to talk to you about is how to 
create this interface between smartness and sustainability and why it's important and how to do that efficiently and effectively with various communities of practice. So this is, this is I think, the biggest value that we can offer. And uh, we also working, will be working more on energy, especially in relation to Positive City Exchange project that has been a very, very powerful, important project to support energy transition. And shall you be interested in working on energy specifically with us in this broader context to become more sustainable and smarter, then please don't hesitate to contact me. And uh, on transport and mobility, I also have an example with me of our mobile, Mobi app, Mobi app, which allows you to actually plan for your journey, for your, uh, using various modes of transport from one place to another. So I can show you in practice on my mobile phone how actually this app can work. So from the big ideas and transition to the small solution, I'm very happy to talk to you about. Thank you. Agata, thank you for your um, amazing insights. Uh, and uh, last but not least, before we move on um, to our uh, panel discussion, I would like to introduce Yerizhi Shtiroki, uh, who is a Spatial Information Section Director at Prague Institute of Planning and Development. Uh, Yerizhi, welcome. And uh, you'll be talking about uh, practical use of data in the city environment. So please, Yerizhi, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very sorry that I cannot be present uh, at your uh, brilliant audience. Uh, it's a uh, more pity that uh, I work for uh, City uh, Institute for Planning and Development, so uh, I should be uh, in camp uh, in our uh, exhibition center. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, due to the COVID situation, I had to stay at home until tomorrow. So, so that that's a pity. However, uh, I'm amazed of uh, uh, great presentation I, I have uh, heard and seen uh, just then I'd like to uh, share with you uh, another point of view another example how uh, cities and especially in our experience uh, uh, can handle uh, data how they can bring the information to the to the uh, open uh, audience open uh, open public and how uh, data can contribute and are contributing, uh, uh, at least in Prague, uh, to the uh, open discussion about the uh, Prague future, about uh, Prague administration, about Prague management, and how uh, data and, uh, and information uh, can uh, benefit better, better uh, governance in, in the city. Uh, Institute for, for Planning and uh, Development uh, is uh, 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 it, it, it's uh, clear from, for the name, from the name for, of the Institute, uh, focused on uh, supporting city with uh, strategic planning, with development planning, uh, with uh, uh, ideas about new uh, constructions and building. Uh, and also it's a hub for uh, planning data. Uh, uh, it has long history uh, over all the 40 years, but in 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 last uh, in last let's say uh, seven eight years, uh, we had uh, become uh, the uh, important uh, center for geodata and planning data for the city for the city boroughs uh, for research institutes uh, sharing and using our data uh, also for businesses. So it, it's happening many things, and we also. Uh, create or work within the environment of uh, sh sharing data, open data uh, in Prague together with other institutes uh, like Ben Kotmel's brilliant project uh, of operator I ICT or, or other uh, municipal organization and city boroughs. Um, we have, uh, uh, when, when I was thinking about what to share with you, uh, how to, how to uh, explain our philosophy of work, uh, I have divided uh, the approach to four simple thoughts or four simple principles. So let's let's start with the with the most uh, uh, basic one. Uh, we do uh, data as a base of efficient uh, administration. Uh, it, uh, this means that city needs to know uh, clear, precise and re uh, relevant information about how uh, area looks like, how city looks like, how, uh, how uh, looks like physical environment, uh, construction features, uh, which means 
you have to measure it, you have to describe it, and you have to somehow summarize it. Let's look at our uh, biggest project or most important project. Uh, very likely the most, uh, most important geodata project uh, in the Czech Republic nowadays is the so-called digital technical map. Uh, Prague uh, is uh, pioneering the way how this uh, type of uh, geodata bases should look like. We have the history of more, more than uh, th 30 years of creation, the digital cartography and the uh, digital technical maps. And um, that's why uh, we uh, so cooperate uh, with uh, national authorities, ministries, and surrounding regions on creation, uh, uh, first leg legislation, and also uh, extending the existing uh, digital technical map, which is in Prague, uh, to the surrounding, uh, surrounding regions. Digital technical map is the base for any planning activities. It, uh, it is an uh, uh, image of all constructions. Uh, it covers the area of the whole Prague. It's regularly um, updated and it's very precise. Uh, it's uh, it based on surveying uh, uh, documentations and, and data from utility uh, providers. So, so it's really a huge project and it's, it's absolutely base for, for any planning uh, uh, activities. Together with uh, 3D model of Prague, which is uh, now uh, being, uh, uh, let's say, updated, if I can uh, use that uh, word, for transition to something like digital twin. Uh, I do not like personally that much the, the term digital twin because it, it's a, like a buzzword, but we would like to create and we are already created uh, integrated uh, geodata model for storing the information about land in 2D, in 3D, uh, uh, information about individual buildings, about surfaces, about and use for, for many many uh, applications uh, from planning to modeling, environmental uh, planning, uh, photovoltaic energy, potential measurement, green roofs, many many things together, uh, uh, and uh, uh, definitely the clear uh, clear. Uh, direction is towards uh, supporting the uh, sustainable uh, and uh, sustainable development uh, and uh, limitation of of uh, uh, climate change uh, in in the city uh, but in our integrated data uh, system is also the uh, uh, geodata related economic data social data and and, and any other uh, uh, together second principle uh, is uh, Data is a base of good decision making. While we have the data, we can and must analyze them, give them to context and interpret the data and create the explanation for uh, final audience, for uh, decision maker, for, for political representation, uh, how uh, the processes in area looks like, what we can expect, what is uh, uh, what is the motor of, of change, how we can uh, influence that, etc. Uh, for, for supporting this, uh, we launched several years ago, and this year we, we have the uh, uh, brilliant output, which is called uh, Planning Analytical, Analytical Material, or, and it's a, a web portal, uh, which is the unique uh, let's say portal for information, not just the data, it's connected definitely to the data uh, and, and visualization, but it's, uh, it's a set of interpretation, analysis, reports, and uh, it's uh, crowned by the uh, summary report on the sustainable development uh, situation in the city of Prague, all connected with metrics, with indicators, with uh, KPIs uh, and, uh, uh, this this uh, document is being updated every four years within all analysis and uh, is uh, now accessible fully for 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 uh, any research and and use uh, in in the city. Uh, similar uh, similar topic uh, 
is uh, here you can see one of the outputs uh, analysis of brownfields and transition uh, transformation zones quite, quite important for, for any planning or uh, uh, our, uh, our contribution to politics towards uh, abatement of uh, urban heat island in Prague, which is the uh, vast analysis on uh, sensitive, sensitive areas uh, in heat waves and uh, uh, it is a background for creation the measures and politics toward abatement of, uh, of, these, of these negative uh, uh, effects. Third, uh, Data is a base of good democratic discussion. It may it, 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 uh, may sound bullish, but it's quite important. Uh, all information and all data, uh, and we see it, uh, for example, now in, in, in Corona situation that, that reliable data, open data as, are absolutely essential for supporting uh, trustworthy uh, discussion uh, within the open uh, public env en environment. So that's why we traditionally long time uh, support opening data, publishing data, promotion the data on, uh, of course, the, of course, the uh, interlinking data and, and good description. I've already talked about that. Um, uh, ben Kotmel uh, has had brilliant uh, 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 contribution uh, uh, about uh, opening the data about the uh, situation uh, in how, how they how they support the opening data in Prague. They uh, are running the open data portal, uh, which I hope will be improved uh, in in soon future uh, because it's a, a relatively old school. Uh, technology running yet, but uh, uh, the technology is not that important as the uh, content which is inside and it's booming. Uh, so Open Data Prague is the biggest, uh, sorry, IPR Prague is the biggest contributor to that to that portal. And we were the first institute, institute in, in Prague who opened uh, all geographical data uh, and are, are also Prague and uh, our institute uh, has uh, pioneered in uh, opening also technical maps, 3D models, uh, etc., and uh, then it become uh, as the as the uh, 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 how to how to do it good practice how to do it uh, in the rest of country. Uh, Prague Geo Portal uh, is also uh, quite uh, uh, important uh, channel how to share not only the data but also the application and information about the data viewers and uh, data services uh, for using uh, the third party solutions so so very important channel and uh, uh, Golemio who you have already seen that for, uh, this is this is mostly for real time data or da data is more frequent update than we have in in our uh, data sets also we uh, we spent a lot of effort for uh, bringing uh, uh, public attraction to what uh, what is happening in field of data in field of planning uh, one of the example is camp itself you are sitting in but also uh, for example this video about uh, how ipr contributes for for research of uh, urban heat island in prague and uh, the last thing definitely not least, not least data as a base of innovation economy we are spending much effort in uh, 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 having common project with universities, with leading uh, technology companies uh, in fields of uh, geodata uh, in Czech Republic, and not only in Czech Republic, we are co collaborating also with uh, cities across uh, Europe, uh, namely in 3D uh, modeling. Uh, this is example of uh, uh, 3D laser scan past project in Prague, and now we are having discussion uh, and preparation uh, consequent uh, analytical uses artificial in intelligence project based how to how to uh, recognize the object how to uh, automatically or semi automatically uh, uh, generate uh, some measurements and, and uh, generate object uh, etc uh, very uh, huge discussion about uh, 
using BIM models, integration, uh, building information models into the uh, uh, into the uh, model of city and digital twin, uh, if you like, uh, integration of passport uh, in the city, sharing the data. Uh, so so uh, another example, we are very active in communication and uh, in shared project with Ministry of Industry and Trade and Czech Standardization Ag uh, Agency. It has much in common, uh, which uh, Agata has, uh, been, uh, has told, uh, lately about uh, ontology, about about taxonomy. That's that's the same situation, uh, which is uh, when integrated data, integration data, quite important. Uh, another project using uh, data from mobile uh, cell uh, operators for location uh, of, of people about monitoring the uh, mobility within the city, about the uh, changing a uh, number of uh, number of population within the city during the day during the uh, so let's say bank holidays or or uh, or uh, uh, special periods uh, like like uh, this covid situation etc quite amazing project very very much research oriented we are uh, having uh, we are now in the process of finishing and, and to be delivered next next uh, May. Or uh, uh, last example, just just uh, look look at it. The cooperation with Skoda Digilab about delivering the re reliable data uh, for supporting the e-mobility for 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 uh, alternative ways uh, of uh, um, mobile. Uh, uh, vehicles uh, uh, offer uh, within the within the city. So many activities and uh, nice results. So uh, to conclude, uh, we are focusing on efficient administration, good decision making, supporting the open discussion, and uh, innovation. So thank you very much. Uh, Yuri, we thank you for a nice walkthrough. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have 10 to 15 minutes to have a quick refreshing coffee, maybe something to drink, and we meet uh, here uh, soon for uh, the panel discussion. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, welcome back. Um, our first panel discussion. I'm glad to welcome you here again, Agata. Gunnar, thank you for joining us. And also, uh, we have some guests uh, via Zoom, um, Anita, uh, that was presenting uh, uh, a couple of minutes ago, and Jiří Čtyřaky, and also Petr Suška from Operator ICT will be joining us uh, for uh, the next 40 minutes or so. Um, there are some questions from Slido, there are some questions from, uh, from the audience. I will start off with the, challenge, with the challenges. I don't like to start off uh, with a negative topic, but uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's see. Um, we, we were talking about um, different approaches uh, towards smart city. They all come together uh, uh, to uh, some main points that you all mentioned. Uh, it's about cooperation, sustainable development. Uh, it's about the data work. It's about added value that comes from the data. And it's about political support. Um, let's start off with what is the biggest challenge in terms of uh, creating a smart city uh, and uh, basically <laughs> coming with the agenda and actually pushing it practically through, because what we can see from the Prague example, there are many ideas, many strategies. It's very difficult to make paper work in real life. So if I, if I may uh, give, give, uh, give a word to each of you, you can start off from your point of view and then we move forward. Thank you. Agata, so if you could start. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, correct. Thank you. So um, I would say, obviously, depending on the context, different challenges uh, in each context, different priorities. Um, my experience has been that it, the most important factor is to try to change people's hearts and minds. It requires a shift in the wider context and in the wider environment and in the municipality itself, a cultural shift whereby there is a not only a belief in certain types of values, but also readiness to uh, put those values into practice. So it's very easy to write um, reports, uh, policy documents and guidelines and 
express the, 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 the values over there. Um, but that shouldn't be a starting point of discussion about values and discussions about the priorities and the readiness to do things. So I would say changing people's hearts and minds is, is a starting point, important starting point for discussions. So that's been, maybe I should stop here and then we can pick up yeah. on various elements of, but that's just, just one element. Yes. Okay, so um, from my point, uh, I work probably on a bit more a practical level, trying to implement a smart city strategy. Uh, and uh, we see that um, it's hard to to get into position to prove the value of what we're doing. So uh, we can do small pilots, we can do testing, but uh, to get people on board, to get them to understand why we're doing this uh, and, and the value, the, the values to be had from it, the benefits, uh, that's uh, a bit challenging. Also, I must say, to be very frank, it's uh, also a bit challenging when we see that there are uh, that we're more or less competing uh, internally from a city administration perspective on who gets to work with the, which elements of the city at what time and doing innovation that way, it, it makes it a bit complicated. Um, so uh, I would wish for a sort of more joint approach also internally uh, without sharing uh, too many secrets. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, if we move to uh, our online panelists, Anita. Yes, I'm perhaps more from a, a political standpoint. I think that the political commitment is, is uh, really key, for example, on sustainability. If we have had a political leadership in the city of Oslo uh, over the decades with different political background that has really set the, the targets. And then we see that the municipality and stakeholders need to work, as you said, across silos and trying to break this down um, to actually get there. But I think also, uh, I believe also that you need to change the hearts and minds, but what we see is that we also need to, if we make things convenient for people based on uh, digital solutions, for example, in our public transport system, we've invested in a good frequency, good service, but with the app, with a good system in place, people actually prefer to use this rather than to use their own car. So it doesn't really, they don't really have to be convinced that they're sustainable. They just have to make the, the sustainable choice. Uh, and then we need to make it attractive. And then I think it's a combination of what you say, the, the data, the working across sectors, uh, but also to have this very clear political commitment to, to guide us. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. If we move to Prague, uh, uh, Yuri, uh, from the uh, operator's point of view, or uh, APER's point of view. Yeah, I fully agree with what was said. Um, from my perspective, uh, what is crucial uh, is uh, improve uh, open communication and uh, discussion between uh, people who are in respect of uh, data, data in, uh, in, any, uh, in any field, which means many, many people and many organizations uh, create the data and use them uh, for their own order uh, or uh, for, for the uh, closest uh, first users who were intended at the beginning uh, as, as user of the data. But what we uh, need more and more is uh, integration, is, is uh, bringing the common context uh, of, of data uh, across the uh, original uh, context. And uh, this discussion is quite, is quite crucial. So I think it's not about technology, it's not about uh, data itself, it's about uh, the opening the mindsets and opening the uh, data context and about discussion, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We'll talk more about that, thank you. Uh, I would like to welcome here Petr Sushka. Uh, Petr, hi. Um, hi, how are you doing? So please, what's your take, what's operator's take on, on the main challenges that you're facing today in, in, uh, in, in, in the context of smart city development? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, well, I think, I think I don't really have much to add. Uh, I think there's, of course, the element of sustainability and, I'm, and I'm, it's really nice to see, uh, particularly uh, Trondheim, but, but of course, uh, Norway in general, to be really you know, spearheading with this topic. And, and I do think that whatever we do, uh, you know, smart cities must become about uh, less about technologies, perhaps, and, and more about um, the climate. And, and that's been something we've been trying to pivot towards um, as well. And I like what, what has been said about collaboration and communication. So um, just for illustration, and I don't think this is really a known fact, but um, so Prague is a one of the, it is the largest employer in Prague. 
it's also the, 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 the largest investor in urban innovations in Prague. And, and this is where it gets interesting, it actually funds urban innovations from about 43% of all the urban innovation projects that take place in Prague. Uh, and, and if we compare that um, number to Stockholm, uh, staying with, 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 uh, with Sweden, Stockholm invests about 11%. And what that shows us is that the, 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 the Swedish partners um, or the Swedish cities, um, and not just them, uh, the German cities are much more capable of leveraging private capital uh, to actually realize, um, you know, and, and build, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to call them smart city projects, but more resilient cities, basically. And and um, I think that's the path to the future. Is is you know we've gotten used to the city really paying for everything, and it's not a sustainable way of of going forward. And I think we need to be forging partnerships and thinking about uh, new forms of partnerships. You know, from joint ventures to to you know something completely new to the way we procure um, technology and solutions uh, in order to be able to actually um, you know make a make a dent in in, in reducing our, our carbon footprint and, and making our cities livable. So that that would be my my concluding remarks. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. If yes, Gunnar, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I want to add something to that because I I totally agree and I see that. Uh, Procurement is uh, one of the uh, spaces or one of the uh, things that need more innovation. Uh, this is one of those factors that can actually uh, make uh, speed up the change and, and help us find the new corporations. But we have to do it in a bit more innovative way. We have to do it uh, to help the cooperation with the, with the private sector. So for us, uh, it, it, it's one of those door openers that we haven't fully been able to push open yet. Uh, we are trying, we are testing various concepts of doing procurement in a more innovative way. Uh, but I wouldn't say we're, we're there yet. There's so many blockers, so many things stopping us. Such as? Well, regulatory, of course. Uh, so uh, it's complex and uh, people who work with procurement aren't assessed on risk taking. And we actually need to take some risk to be able to solve this in the future. And we need to respect that the private sector uh, needs their re revenue. They need to build uh, solid solutions that will last for many years. Uh, if they only build it because we thought it was a good idea for the city of Stavanger, uh, it won't be sustainable. It won't last, right? So they need a broader market. We we'll have to help them with that, even if it's sort of commercial thinking. But I think it's very important or else we won't have the solutions for the future. And we can't pay for all of this ourselves. Mm -hmm. Agatha, please. Yes, um, I have one more remark. Um, from my observation, it's there is still too much focus on what is easy to measure and to quantify, especially with regard to the use of ICT technologies or um, a specific uh, infrastructure projects and uh, uh, services projects. It as if we were focusing on what is the most tangible. But many issues relating to environmental protection are not tangible. They are not that easy to man measure, such as uh, or, or e other issues relating to social inclusion or is social exclusion. How do you measure it? Does it make it any less worthwhile? No, it doesn't. But that being said, we are still lacking uh, with certain metrics to be able to measure things. But at the same time, there is a need for mental shift and recognition that because it's difficult to measure, that doesn't mean you shouldn't measure it. That shouldn't. It doesn't mean you shouldn't invest in it. It just simply means it's difficult to measure in this certain moment in time, and there is a need to improve this element of the whole process. So I think that enables, if we make this step, it really enables us to connect smartness and sustainability in a more effective way. But it's a little bit of a chicken and egg dilemma. What do you do first? Yeah, uh, it's a great point that you mentioned. It's about what we can and what we cannot measure. And uh, it's difficult to gain support for something that you cannot actually show. And my next question is uh, towards uh, sustainable development. We are talking about climate a lot because it's measure measurable by temperature raise, right? But there are a lot of soft, different uh, uh, things that we can measure in terms of uh, city development, but it's difficult to put in, into numbers. How, uh, aren't we focusing too much on something like climate, uh, which is important, but just uh, not uh, taking into account different 
part of city development. For example, in Prague, I see it a lot that uh, climate is tangible problem, uh, inclusion is uh, not. So my question is, uh, uh, shouldn't we be focusing on a, a more thorough concept, broader concept of, of, of measuring uh, the development of smart cities? In my, in my opinion, indeed, we should. Um, there is a need for a mental shift in that, uh, with re that regard to as well. So traditionally in policy making and in policy analysis, the hardcore evidence, uh, the numbers been particularly powerful. However, there is a lot of value in storytelling about how the things have changed, evolved. So using the storytelling, the narrative, the case studies, which are much more qualitative, really allows us to reflect on the quality of the processes taking part in the cities. So we have the quantitative aspect, which is, as I said, usually easier to capture, and the qualitative aspects relating, for instance, to quality of life. I mean, there are metrics, quantitative metrics on the quality of life, but how how do you measure how the quality of life changes over a period of time? What is the meaning of it, the meaning of it for the residents? Because all in all, the, we are developing the policies and we're making decisions to improve the livelihoods of individuals. Yeah, so. it's, it's, yeah it's, it's, it's always easy for people to put something into one number, right? When you have to write something down and read it, then <laughs> yeah, the problem starts. Uh, uh, Gunnar, you wanted to add something? Yeah, so uh, I, I agree. Uh, the qualitative is getting to be much more important, uh, and it's a means of, uh, of involving citizens in a more sort of meaningful way. Uh, just as uh, an example, we started uh, some projects where we are using artists in city development. We really want to challenge ourselves and how we work with city development, uh, and not only looking at the numbers, but actually looking at what what is meaningful for the people, and what could be an alternative approach to uh, part of the city than what our sort of uh, our regular normal planners would would uh, the way they would approach it? We start with other types of values, but of course, yes, it's hard to measure. But uh, I, I'm guessing in the long run, this will be measured as quality of life. So um, let's try to move it in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, guys on Zoom, uh, do you want to add something to that? Um, yes, Anita? Yes, I can just echo what is said. Of course, uh, in urban development, you need to, to factor in all these things that uh, are mentioned. Uh, and also, we see that my, many of the benefits of the, the climate action is also uh, positive on people's health, uh, on air quality, uh, if you introduce the, the, the rhythm or the, the, the biking as a, a means of transport, it, it improves your health. And I think we also working a lot when we uh, closing the city center for cars or almost uh, shutting down for cars. It's not because we want to reduce the, the greenhouse gas emissions as say, but we want to create a city center that is more vibrant where you can uh, look at what is the sense of, of a, a square of a, a place that people can feel comfortable and, and enjoy city life. So there are so many aspects to, to uh, sustainable urban development. And we are also focusing more now on, on neighborhoods rather than just the city center. What is uh, what the quality of this neighborhood and how can we improve? How can we work with social cohesion? How can we get everyone involved? So I think the, the sustainability aspect is, as you know, also the social and economic dimension. And we really need to combine all three if we are to succeed. And I think also there's a big gap in in public support uh, that we seem to uh, see, uh, at least in, in Oslo, that it's the, the, the green policies are very much for the middle class, but we need to get everyone on board. So we need to create policies that are attractive also to, to all the parts of our, our citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for mentioning political support throughout throughout uh, the whole morning. Uh, I would like to stop at that for a while. Uh, politic uh, yes, I got you wanted to add something. Uh it's, it's apologies. Um, I just thought of um, one example that is actually very insightful when it comes to um, re reflecting on the s smart sustainable cities is, for instance, the quality of the ecosystems. 
have obviously there is research on the quality of ecosystems on the relationships between various institutions and organizations but we really insufficiently take that into account so this you can put the numbers into that but in fact it's much more powerful to create a story on that so what is the relationship between the sectors institutions and organizations how they work with each other it's much easier to write it down saying Trondheim has been collaborating with NTNU and with Sintef on a certain type of issues over, over a period of time to source innovative ideas and knowledge and now can you tell me how to put numbers on that hmm. but this is a key element in our progress towards smartness and sustainability so that's that's yeah, just thank an you. example yeah. Um, back to political support. Uh, when there is political support, there is will to to to, to change. Uh, when there is lack of, of it, uh, it's harder to to push forward. Um, and my question is, and uh, it's it's a, it's a great case study. Maybe maybe Norway a great case study for the Czech Republic. How to gain uh, how to gain political support uh, for this change, and what are the mechanisms that you are using or you have been using to actually increase this political support to have the same goal, to have it long term, and to actually follow it. Uh, anyone uh, can can join, guys. So um, let's. Yeah, I can, I can say methodologically um, how it yeah. works in um, and give an example from Trondheim. So basically, um, we have deliberate approach to scaling. Scaling, which means um, replicating certain ideas and knowledge and practices in various contexts. So we use three types of scaling. And I'm actually talking about it as if it would be like, it is uh, research driven, but it's also how we operate. So it is scaling out, scaling up and scaling deep. So scaling out, which means that if, if we have a certain idea or a proposition or a practice, we are really working across various communities of practice, such as with businesses, NGOs and academia, to make sure that this concept or this idea or this practice practice is recognized. The second we're scaling up, so we're trying to influence policies and guidelines and standards to, to, to include certain idea, knowledge of practice or policy and so on and so forth. And scaling deep, we are really trying to think about what are the normative assumptions behind certain ideas and knowledge in order to make sure that it's well embedded. So this practice really sets the ground for our work. So thanks to this, we are able to generate a, a support that we need to. So this is what we do analytically. And this is possible to do in, even in a short period of time. For instance, in Trondheim Commune, as I mentioned, we work on sustainable value creation. It's the concept we emer that emerged this year. And by now, everyone in Trondheim Commune knows what is sustainable value creation. Because within a year, we've practiced scaling up, scaling out, and scaling deep. And everyone knows the value of it, and everyone knows the, the normative assumption of it. So the question of smartness is no longer the question of ICT infrastructure, it's the question of sustainability. So it's possible to do, but that required a lot of groundwork. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, to add an, uh, another example from Norway, we. Um, I was talking earlier about uh, the Norwegian and the Nordic uh, roadmap development, and what was quite interesting, it was, it, it was a bottom-up approach where we gathered people in a network. Uh, the different cities, we didn't have uh, national uh, governmental support. They actually told us, you have to figure this one out yourselves. Uh, so we did. We, uh, but the only way we could do it was to do it together, city-to-city -city collaboration. And that's how we built uh, the narrative we had the examples, we built a um, uh, common uh, joint roadmap, and then we presented it to the government, and they said, we'll uh, approve this, we'll join in, and now it's sort of from a national level back down. And then it comes back into our cities as a national approach, so which actually makes it easier yeah, to, to, to make sure that everyone's aboard, because you don't really get to be profit in your own city, right? So it's, it's better to, have, to, to get the, the assistance and the help from the cities around you, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, of course. Please, you can you can take a new one. Yeah, yes. No, because th th thank you. Just a comment from my side. Yes. Is that I think it's very important that the the politicians see how the green aspects and also how to succeed with the green deal is to succeed with the smart city, and that they see when, for example, we had the, the, the Nordic Edge conference. Uh, Gunnar was there. Every people were there, the vice minister was there, and then he is seeing the sentiments coming out of the conference. And, and the point is that then they also understand that the power 
is in the driving force, in the room, in those creating new solutions. And I think that this concept of conviction, I'm convinced, I'm, our Minister of, uh, of Foreign Affairs made a speech about the key priorities in the, in the seminar earlier this year with the European Commission. And on the fifth place of how to succeed with the Green Deal came the issue of succeeding with the smart city. So I think that to lifting it up into, as we have done in Norway, into the government with a, with a contribution to the European Commission and also working like this on it. I know the, the sentiments out there. I know how they are working at ground level and also with support through, for example, how to make better use of the EU programs, succeed in Euro 2020, etc. So, I mean, that is the whole atmosphere of queer mandate. So, it's partially the groundwork, and I think when we see the blessing and enthusiasm coming from the people sitting here, you also, the politicians, see the same. And then bureaucrats like me support the process the best we can. So, I think it's a bottom-up movement, and it's an issue to make the, the success of the region, success of what is happening. Mm. And uh, so this is also that I said, Stavanger is quite not that big, but the greater Stavanger has much a big, bigger power than alone. So that's, that's my mind after being a bureaucrat for very many years. I think that and the politicians, they are like us when it comes to an end. They won't like to see results. Thank you. Thank you, Gare, for the insight. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I like that you mentioned uh, this regional cooperation as a part of, uh, so to say, uh, uh, the process. And I would like to ask uh, uh, the pr uh, Prague uh, gentlemen uh, that are on online, um, uh, the data that you are um, having and you are working with, do you cooperate with, uh, with uh, different cities? Or what's the potential, for example, for Prague's cooperation uh, with uh, regional municipalities at the moment? Okay, <clears throat> well, um, um, it's a hard question. Uh, there is, uh, to, to be honest, there is not much uh, common project uh, with uh, uh, focused on, on, on sharing data uh, uh, nowadays uh, between Prague and the surrounding uh, cities. Uh, what must be said that uh, this uh, atmosphere is uh, changing uh, after last election very much and uh, I have already uh, noticed in my uh, presentation that we launched the big common project with the uh, Central Bohemia region to create a common digital technical map. Uh, which is something uh, very unique in uh, in uh, Czech uh, experiences uh, in, in, uh, that two regions which uh, which are uh, uh, by the government uh, uh, completely separate uh, will will share uh, uh, the same uh, data background, share data processes, and, and and create really the one connected environment. And we see it as a as the first step towards creating uh, in the future more integrated environment for, for sharing the data, not only for, for Prague, but the whole central uh, central uh, Bohemian region, which is uh, about uh, nearly 3 million people, which is which is a great, great hub of, of uh, economy and, and uh, people. So so uh, we, we see that uh, all the activity that, that first uh, what has changed is the atmosphere and trust between the representation, trust between institutes uh, is, be is, is becoming uh, higher. And then also uh, there is an open way to, to uh, common project, even if it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Petr? Um, uh, yeah, so I think for us it's, a, it's in a lot of ways a bit easier. So I think uh, Ben Kotmel, he presented the uh, the, the 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 data platform uh, Golemio uh, that we we basically designed we use some some principles um, and some 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 kind of basic basic building pillars from Cisco but we have designed it for, to to fit our needs because um, our focus was very very specific and uh, so to that end it's an open source open collaboration platform uh, which uh, we are offering to cities if they want to use it or regions uh, basically uh, for free of course what what is what is uh, or can be uh, more difficult is the adaptation to the local context but uh, we have been in discussions particularly in the in the Czech Republic with uh, I think two or three different regions 
who um, for whom it, it is very difficult and expensive to develop their own data platform. And they'd rather opt for something that basically is out there and they will just adapt it to their particular requirements. And I think it does make sense, particularly for, for larger cities uh, to, to offer this out. And we've seen this in, in Finland. Um, we've seen this, uh, I mean, all over the place. I'm sure there are examples in Norway as well, whereby, you know, cities share uh, these, these platforms or architectures that can uh, be kind of brought over. And I, and I just think it does make sense to, to uh, you know, use a thing to, to not not to reinvent a wheel uh, since it's already there. Um, so um, that's that's what I would say is we've seen we've seen a rising demand for this and uh, and um, yeah, uh, you guys are also welcome to use it if if you would like. It's it's not in English, but it could probably translate it. I'm sure. Thank you, Gunnar. You wanted to add something? Yeah. So. Um... We see another challenge. So we, we are sharing, we are working in sort of regional networks, national networks, but we also see that, uh, uh, of course, uh, big and small, there's a difference when it comes to competency and, and enough people to actually do the work. So, for instance, when we are working on open data, we actually have to provide our neighboring cities with the competency, the resources to do the work, to find the data and share it from their systems. At least we have to help them start doing it and then we can sort of move back afterwards after it's up and running, the, the, the process is in place. And in Norway now we have um, established uh, some regional digital networks. Uh, Digir Ogeland, which is uh, from my region, uh, has 20 to 23 municipalities working together on digital initiatives. And it's the same throughout, uh, throughout Norway. And it's a method for scaling. And just as a very small uh, example on what can come out of it, uh, we did, um, a uh, flood prevention project uh, where we wanted to know future flooding in the city of Stavanger. But we actually established the project, we got some national funding, and we uh, had uh, two uh, Sauda and Gestalt, two municipalities on the opposite ends of the, of the region to be the front runners for the project. So we helped them uh, acquire sensors to do the measuring of water levels, uh, throughput, etc. And then we centralized all the data in a central data lake uh, that was established as part of the project, which might not have happened if we went through all the democratic uh, hoops and uh, uh, yeah, bureaucracy but, uh, 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 with the politicians. But actually, as part of this project, we suddenly we found ourselves having data from two municipalities into a third one, ours, uh, in a centralized data lake. And now we can predict coming flooding into the city of Stavanger using and leveraging the other municipalities. And everyone was so happy and now we're building on the same platform with road sensors, with uh, water quality sensors, etc. And it's sort of, uh, it's uh, almost like organic growth. So uh, I think it's a beautiful story on how we actually manage to do these things together, but you must be willing to share, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the red tape or uh, bureaucracy that's standing in the way of, uh, of development. So sometimes it's just a good thing just to uh, outsmart the red tape by some uh, projects uh, ad hoc and try to be innovative, uh, right? Probably shouldn't or comment. <laughs> okay, uh, let's talk about uh, private capital because you're talking about uh, the municipality, the people, two important stakeholders, but there will be no city development without private monies involved. Um, Again, if we take a uh, check Prax example, we see corporations, we, we see them on the, the ad hoc basis, not on a conceptual long term uh, basis. How to create this relationship between private businesses and uh, city development to make this mechanism work? Anita, can we uh, include you in our conversations? Uh, what's, what's, the, what's Oslo's? Uh, take I think uh, we need to, you know, uh, get every type of investment that we can. So we have this business for climate network, for example, where we work with the progressive companies and the most progressive, they don't really need our funding to, to be able to, to work with their strategies, but they need our really clear policies and targets. And it shouldn't be a moving target. It should be a quite fixed target. Uh, and I think also we have some innovation funding, but we really see the public procurement as where we can come in. And often we have to pay a little bit extra to put uh, environmental criteria in, in our tenders. But this is then our way of 
of paying for developing this market. And uh, we also, as I said, try to work with different actors to actually get the predictability for companies so that they can actually do invest in the new technologies and know that they can then uh, win the tenders in Oslo, but also from the national government or from other municipalities in our, our region or even in, in the big in Scandinavian region. So I think there's a combination of all these um, ways of getting the, the investments also in from the private sector, but it's, it's not an easy, easy win. And I think the bigger companies are often a little bit more progressive than, than the smaller ones that might um, yeah, need a little bit more push. But we're also working now to actually offer our city as a test bed for, for new uh, products and services and companies. And we're trying to also then be on, on the offering side, not to offer money, but to offer test sites, for example, which can also help in developing these new solutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh from Prague, uh, 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 has, has, has the relationship between the city and uh, private capital been uh, developing uh, in, uh, in the last uh, years? And in, in what way? I mean, I can comment on the uh, work we do with data. So there is uh, a lot of collaboration with Waze, for example. They provide um, uh, data for free to us. And we're able to, you know, use that to, you know, measure commuting distances to to the airport or to see where there are self-reported incidents of different types. So we're doing, for example, an analysis of potholes based on waste data, so qualitative data. Um, there are other types of data that that um, we're going to be um, getting an access to, and they're spent data for Mastercard. Uh, they're extremely valuable data that we're getting. Um, uh, from from Mastercard, uh, and we'll be looking at uh, different different aspects and building behavioral profiles of of kind of people that come to Prague. So when you come from Norway, I know it's a Norwegian card, and I know what you're spending on, and and I can you know cater uh, around that uh, hopefully uh, in the future. Um, so so that's that's been something we've been doing, um, and and there has been you know I think the uh, I, and I think it's similar the the, the large corporates are. Kind of ready to show that things work in Prague, and we do have a huge advantage that Prague is a world famous city, um, and so it gives us the the luxury to be able to choose who we want to work with. Um, but I think it's also important not to forget about uh, you know some of the SMEs and 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 the local startup uh, community, and make sure that they kind of we bring them on board and we help them accelerate, um, and and you know. Uh, grow. So, uh, you know, I think there has been a slow start, but um, we are we are realizing, and I think the, the political leadership knows this, that uh, we cannot move ahead without the, the private sector on board uh, in some form. And I, and, and I don't know, maybe Yeji has, has a yeah, different experience. But... Uh, yeah, you have already uh, set all the uh, important aspects, but what, what can, uh, uh, can I add? to it is uh, it's booming. Uh, the situation is booming, uh, especially in uh, new or, or innovative uh, ways how to get the data, how to use the data with, with the platform, with the, uh, with the uh, information system used for uh, uh, state agendas or, or, or some uh, operation uh, in, in companies creating. Uh, there is huge interest uh, among uh, both city and the private sector of creation uh, focus digital twins or 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 uh, we call it we call it uh, information model of built up and uh, built up environment uh, what i i see as a issue for the future uh, as challenge is how to convert this uh, research more or less research and development project into daily routine project that that's something crucial. It's, it it comes with financing, with uh, finding this uh, uh, sustainable way of financing these these new uh, new projects. Uh, and uh, we would like to see not only that uh, interesting uh, ideas and proof of concept and pilot project, but also uh, sustainable solutions. And this is this is a, another thing which we have to focus on. So we, we are now in a, more or less in a stage of of uh, networking, of of creating pilots, pre, uh, creating uh, first research and development uh, uh, project, even if they might be huge. But uh, there is not much not much uh, uh, 
uh, daily routine project uh, with, uh, with, with experience way how to combine the private uh, private uh, interfaces, sources, and the municipal or, or public sources together and using it for, for a longer time. It, it, it must yet to be delivered. Mm -hmm. If I can um, just add here, for us, it all starts with co-creation. Um, so instead of down the line in the process, inviting private sector partners to deliver infrastructure as service, you co-create the infrastructure and service and you actually do that. So again, you walk the talk. So you monitor what is what are the developments in the private sector, what are the developments in various fields to be on track, to be able to have your hands on or what are the processes, the practices that are currently booming, what value that it provides. So it comes from knowledge and awareness, inviting even at very ad hoc basis, private sector partners into discussion in order to keep the relationships alive and then co-creating opportunities because some of them may be as part of realization of local plans and pro projects and programs but opportunities can also be created through discussions and collaborations and i think this is the greatest value it's this creating opportunities rather than implementing something that is in the plan i mean both processes are super important but in order to really support ecosystem development you should also be proactive and I think this is very distinctive about Trondheim and I'm personally I'm witnessing um, on the weekly or bi-weekly basis startups joining us in the Center for Sustainable Development talking about I don't know food security uh, waste management all kinds of issues so we know what's happening in the field so we're doing that um, on the speculation or almost speculation basis let's see what is out there so that mental shift is I think it's needed as well mm -hmm. thank you Gunnar yeah, so uh, just a quick comment uh, to what Anita said. I'm, I also agree that the big sort of capital, big industry uh, players, they don't really need our money. They they need our approval, right? They need the, the, the regulations in place. But uh, what I would like, uh, which is uh, aligned with what, what Agatha is saying, that we need to keep uh, the, the connection and the collaboration alive. So it's actually two ways. And not only until something is being built or developed, but also afterwards. So if we can get into position to both initially co-create, but then afterwards keep this as a sort of a, a, a living project, it would be so much better to take it to the next stage and so on. And also, uh, I would like to comment on the, on the startup scene because I also believe that we have a responsibility to cater to the to the SMEs, to the startups, uh, and to make sure that uh, when we have some at least some type of uh, low level problems, that we should share our problems openly, uh, so the startup scene can actually work on them. And maybe we should even pay them for doing our problem solving before it becomes a huge uh, procurement process and big industry, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's mm -hmm. my suggestion. Yeah, it's a very important point, and uh, we see uh, startups and SMEs uh, involving in, in Prague's development uh, every day almost uh, with uh, various projects, apps, um, uh, m mobility, sustainable mobility development, a uh, very big role uh, of uh, these companies. Um, how to maintain the momentum? Uh, I, I, I don't know about the methodology uh, of indexes of smart cities, but if I look on Prague, it seems like it lost its momentum. Uh, it's, it's dropping in, 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 in ratings in terms of uh, smart city index. And my question is, I don't know, it's a, a IMD, IMD, IMD methodology, and I don't want to argue on what's right, but uh, my question is, uh, how, how not to lose the momentum? Uh, is it the, the, the communication problem uh, or is it the procurement problem? And hasn't the COVID actually slowed down the development of uh, sustainable cities, maybe focused on different problems? Yes, I start? yes please. Yes. So this is uh, a discussion that we have, have uh, every now and then. Uh, I think it's a bit about sort of the packaging. Uh, so uh, it's, it's easier to understand now if we talk about sustainable cities. Uh, so you actually said it right. So it's uh, the smart city. Uh, the smart city term has has matured, has grown. It's something completely different now than it was five years ago, which means that the followers, if if it was the old followers, followers, and they didn't mature along the way, okay, it, it will lose interest. It will be something different, right? So yes, it's a communication issue, 
But I wouldn't say that we should spend too much time on solving that. Okay. I would rather say that uh, let's go with it. Let's let the whole concept mature. Let's realign with the, with the, what's important for us now for the sustainable development of the city. So it's it's not bothering me. But what bothers me is uh, when you get discussions like, well, uh, the smart city is tech driven, or the um, especially the smart city from the Americas and Asia. Is uh, the smart city in Singapore? Singapore. It says uh, the book titles, uh, articles, etc. And it's like, no, it's not. The smart city has become smart, so it's actually doing something different. Mm. Thank you, uh, Gather. So, um, as a prolongation of what has been said, indeed, the metrics didn't manage to catch up with the development. So we have almost third generation, I don't know, fourth generation of smart sustainable cities, whereby the metrics still measure the previous generations. Okay. So a lot of excellence disappears from the measurement framework. And a lot of quality that is the being developed in the city in this matter is disappearing. So it is much more convenient to actually talk about transitioning process rather than indexing process per se, with all the lim limitations that indexing brings. But also on the other side, I see the value. Uh, in terms of uh, branding, attracting capital, and everything else. But that being said, we're still using the old yes. tools. Yes. Uh, gentlemen, Anita, uh, do you want to add something to that? Uh, maybe Prague's perspective? Oslo's perspective? Well, I'm not really in the, the, the smart city bubble, but I think that we need to do everything <laughs> smarter anyway. And, I, and just to the point with if COVID had slowed down these processes, I think perhaps rather the opposite, that we have now had this major challenge in our hands and we have using data, digital tools, cooperating across the sectors, managed to actually handle it rather well to develop new solutions, also technological solutions to help us in this, this crisis, uh, and if we can use this uh, momentum also going forward in, in the sustainability work, I think we have uh, learned a lot that we can, can continue to work and, and actually speed up the process as we go out to the, the COVID, hopefully by the spring, summer. Well, hopefully. Gunnar, you wanted to add something? Uh... Yeah, so uh, I have to answer uh, when it comes to these indexes all the time, right? The politicians ask me. Why aren't we on top, like you yeah. said, uh, or uh, among the top three or top ten? And I'm, I'm trying to play it a little bit down because it, I find it quite fascinating that there are uh, parking companies who are evaluating how smart we are. So it, it comes from the perspective of sort of who's, who's actually doing the indexing. And I have many uh, emails of, from companies who want to do an assessment and they want me to pay for the assessment to become uh, high up on the ranking of smartness. And that's not smart, I would argue. But I have to, I have to uh, again and again, uh, explain this to our politicians. But how to compare it internationally? Because if you Google smart city, cities, then, you, then all, the, all the indexes pop up. So then the information you're getting is those numbers, the, the, the one number that, that we were talking about at the beginning. So how to, how to compare ourselves internationally? I really like the approach that, that Agatha is, uh, is uh, proposing. That's another way and probably a more sustainable way of doing it in the f for the future. Mm -hmm. Agatha, it's your yes, question. So, so, so uh, this international comparison benchmark is, is certainly something we cannot escape and avoid. But what we can do is to be transparent and accountable for limitations of such measures, which is not sufficiently really being discussed. So once we really account on what is measuring, what is being measured, what is not being measured, then we can have a decent discussion. If we avoid that element, then, then it becomes a, a, a little bit of a game. Um, so, so that being said, uh, we still need to work on those type of indexes and really be able to position it. So that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't change the fact that we need, to, we need to work on it. But what I find the most fascinating in the whole indexing process and benchmarking and comparison, it is a starting point for discussion. And myself, I, I have a PhD on sustainability assessment precisely because I was trying to really understand what is the almost objective and subjective value of sustainability assessments. And my, my discovering and also my personal experience with working with various sustainability assessment methodologies and standards is that the biggest value comes from within enabling learning and discussion and putting everyone on the same page and starting a discussion. Because the fact that certain type of measures doesn't fully 
or in a, certain, in a particular way account on something because measures are flawed. They are flawed by, by nature, but it starts a discussion about this flawedness that, that by, by the extension enables learning and people being on the same page. So it really, this is the biggest value in my personal experience in indexing process, benchmarking, comparison, and sustainability assessment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I, if yeah. I can add, add something to that, uh, uh, we are back in discussion about how to measure the quality, how to, how to measure the immeasurable uh, aspects. And uh, in my point of view, uh, the measuring measurement sustainability is uh, really about uh, uh, getting the background for studying, for comparison, for benchmarking, for, for discussion, and for thinking about what is, uh, how the ad others are approaching to the same thing, in which environment, in which context. And this brings uh, new knowledge and new impulses. So, so uh, in my point of view, uh, the good rates in in uh, in the uh, index are well uh, good motivators, but uh, they are more or less uh, the uh, showcase where to look at for the uh, better practices and where to study from and uh, where to have the discussion. So so this is this is about the measurement of of quality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, if I if I can comment, of course. Um, I do understand that there is this need to measure everything nowadays, um, but uh, you know I, I don't really care about the numbers. If you're doing your job well, uh, you know the 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 side effect is that you know you might be placing high or down, uh, and it really depends on the methodology. But um, ultimately, I'm not here to compete with other cities. I'm really here to learn from other cities, or to collaborate, or to share with other cities. You know, and, and I think and I think at the end of the day, when you look at these indexes, you always have to ask, you know, who benefits from this? Like what value does this bring? And I'm just very, very, very skeptical that that it that it helps push anything, um, you know, maybe a bit of media hysteria. Uh, but but that's it. And, and so so, you know, and I think I, I think uh, rather, uh, the, you know, I don't really see a point. I think uh, I rather, uh, you know, if someone wants to be measuring, you know, sure, sure. Why not? But um but I think uh, you know we should be focused on our on our uh, job, uh, you know, making the city more livable and 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 more sustainable. And I think, and, and there was a, there was the question, right? You know, how has the pandemic impacted all of these um, indexes or indices? And 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 very very significantly because you know if you ask people about transport you know, during the pandemic and then after the pandemic, everyone's going to be unhappy, particularly people that are driving around in cars, because of course their their reference model or their reference has dropped. They're used to, you know, driving through empty cities for a year and suddenly, you know, there are many more cars on the road and, and people are unhappy about that. So, you know, you know, you don't win in this in this scenario. And I think and I think it doesn't make sense to be explaining these methodologies. I think it just makes sense to focus on what we are here to do. And, 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 and I, think, I think that's it. You know, I, I wouldn't be too discouraged by, by wherever Prague is on whatever index. You know, OECD has different one. Bloomberg has different one. Uh, the, the, the Mercer in the, I don't, I mean, there are so many indices that, you know, if you were just, you know, driving your decision making on the basis of, of who is writing about you is, is uh, you know, I, I don't think you'd be able to manage the city well. So um, that's that's my skeptical uh, contribution to the discussion about. Uh, well, thank you for skepticism. I like how, how Peter from uh, operator ICT who works with data said, I don't care about numbers. Uh, this is how media uh, hysteria is, is being created live. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be finishing uh, our uh, first uh, discussion panel. Do you have any questions here from the audience? Maybe a quick comment that you would like to add before we go for a quick lunch. If not, uh, I would like to uh, thank you a lot for your time and for your insights. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah. Um, and thank you for uh, joining us online. Dear viewers, we'll have a short break for lunch. Please feel free to have, uh, so have something to eat and we'll be meeting here in about 45 minutes. Uh, start a discussion about the future of city uh, sustainable mobility. Thank you. 
So ladies and gentlemen, uh, please, uh, if uh, I may kindly ask you to return, we will continue with our conference. Um, we are coming into the second phase of our debates, um, the conference about the future of a city uh, sustainability and development in the context of smart cities. In the next part, we'll be focusing on e-mobility and, so to say, um, uh, development in terms of sustainable living. And I would like to welcome here Jaromir Konečný, who is a project manager of Operator ICT. And in the next 15 minutes, he will be talking about smart urban mobility. Jaromir, please, the floor is yours. Clicker, One, two. Okay. So, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Jaromir Konečny. I am a project manager from uh, Operator ICT. It's uh, city company and I hope uh, there was uh, my colleague this evening. So uh, I'm responsible for uh, project uh, development, uh, developing electromobility here in Prague and I would like uh, to introduce my pre presentation where electromobility aims in Prague. So, uh, uh, we prepared the, uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning of this year uh, the document, uh, it called uh, General uh, the Plan for uh, Support Developing of uh, uh, Charging Infrastructure here in Prague until 2030. The, main uh, topic it's uh, the plan how to uh, build recharging infrastructure uh, with uh, 4500 uh, public charging station in in prague in context of the city plans uh, for the development of uh, ecological transportation uh, the prague have uh, got climate commitment uh, to reduce 45% uh, of uh, in, uh, in uh, carbon emission by 2030. So uh, uh, it's a plan how to reach this goal uh, because uh, for uh, 1,500 charging station, it's a, a plan to care about station for up to 2,000 electric cars uh, by 2030. Uh, we are developing a uh, new project uh, for uh, public transport, uh, transport company. It's a project for four pole buses too. It's planned how to, uh, how to uh, use a uh, new type of electrobuses in public services. Uh, in plan, we would like to uh, build the station for Prague in cooperation with private sector. So we are following the national plan to, uh, for electromobility. So we prepared uh, uh, about uh, three scenarios, how can grow electromobility in Prague. Uh, it's a low scenario, medium and height. And uh, as you can see, main growth is uh, awaiting after the 2025. And at the end of this decade, we are, we are waiting about 160,000 uh, battery electromobility here in Prague and about 4,000 plug-in hybrids in Prague. So uh, that's uh, the main reason we would like prepare 
about 405,000 public charging stations. So we are developing two separate options uh, because at the general we uh, have evaluated five separate options and Prague City Council has selected two options. We are further developing. As you can see at this table, uh, there are some differences between uh, financial costs and benefits. And uh, now we are finishing uh, the document uh, with comparison of uh, uh, of these two variants uh, means variants concession model V4 and variant uh, JV joint venture model V5. And we will submit it for uh, assessment of city council until the end of this year. And for us is important that uh, these two variants have uh, got the, the similar uh, social benefits as you can see as in this uh, in the right parts of the table and uh, got the it's it's a similar uh, opportunity opportunity to reduction the same uh, the same count of uh, carbon emission So here is a road plan we are working with. Uh, as I uh, said, uh, we finished the general plan uh, uh, at, the, at the beginning of this year. And next year, we would like to uh, prepare for the city uh, the realization project. And uh, we hope uh, at the and of uh, next year, we can we can uh, start providing the first charging services at uh, public charging station. Uh, we are talking about 100 char charging station, and uh, until the uh, 2026, we would like. Uh, finished and full uh, and and provide full functionality station at uh, 70 750 points so uh, there is there are some opportunity uh, which can city use for uh, support the uh, public infrastructure. One of these opportunity is uh, use uh, public lightning. Uh, so uh, just now uh, it's uh, it's uh, running the project for prepare about three thousand everyday everyday lamps uh, till twenty twenty six. It's a project for uh, pre prepare the public lamps uh, to install wall box. Uh, it's it's uh, there, there are some lamps by the uh, public uh, public parking lots, sure. And uh, one of benefit of this project is uh, you can use. Uh, you can use uh, the land in uh, the lands are owned by the city, so you can reduce the paperwork. And uh, as we talk, uh, the standard installation here in Prague it's about uh, 12 months. But uh, this way we can reduce about half of time, so uh, realization. Uh, with every lumps, it's about six months. Next, uh, next uh, benefit, it's uh, this way you can reduce about ten time costs. Uh, one of benefits, sure, is about uh, the provider of uh, public lightning system is. Uh, 
public company technology, capital city of Prague. So uh, we can manage this project uh, more, more faster and more efficient. So we can uh, care about sustainability of this project. And uh, we talked about how to prevent vendor lock. So it's, uh, it's about how to care about uh, the services when uh, the one-off partner will finish his contract. And uh, a possible solution is uh, provide unified payment system for urban recharging. Uh, I can again uh, describe. Uh, that means uh, the prime uh, provider of electromobility services will be, for example, pub, uh, public company and will share the services uh, as, uh, as uh, a roaming partner for another companies and this way we can guarantee uh, low price of services and uh, at the other side of the charge you can see the uh, another company can be CPO it mean uh, charge point operator just as uh, pro uh, sub uh, support partner for a public company. It's an it's opportunity for uh, use standardization in services uh, and uh, it's opportunity for cab, uh, care about roaming of the services because we hope the roaming is one of the best way to guarantee uh, to guarantee uh, services for owner of electromobile. In this slide, I would like uh, looking back on 2020 here in Prague. Uh, 2.6 times more electro cars sold in Czech Republic compared to 2019. So we are working. Uh, in our project, we uh, recommend availability about 13 electro vehicles per charging station. So as you can see at the chart in year 2019, uh, there were about uh, 263 electro, electro car, uh, sorry, uh, 263 uh, charging station and uh, next year it was about 315 charging station. So uh, as you can see, uh, the ratio between the number of cars and number of station was uh, in year 2090 optimal, but uh, next year it's uh, the ratio 25 to one, and uh, it's a, a important reason to support developing of public station here of Prague, here in Prague. Uh, during the preparation of a uh, project, we identified some highlights of, uh, of uh, public charging uh, topic. Uh, the Prague residents expect electromobility to be a full-fledged replacement for standard fueled car. So uh, that's mean they are looking for uh, standard services as uh, they are used to uh, during uh, the traveling by the standard car. So uh, Prague needs to and a well accessible network of charging station. Uh, one, one way is roaming as guarantee of rapid 
expansion of electromobility and uh, the city will provide a parking space with regard to ensuring sustainable condition for the developing of, uh, of public space. So uh, that's our common topic and uh, we hope the electromobility is common cause with uh, private sector. And uh, how to combine the interest of the city and the private sector? Uh, we identified uh, these needs of the city. Uh, the one topic is public space versus even coverage. You know, because uh, the city uh, don't want to build the station exactly on a special place like historical center. Uh, uh, the city needs for uh, the public's use-friendly use price and uh, needs uh, to guarantee uh, parking expansion. That means uh, solve uh, the situation with uh, regular on and non-regular parking. And uh, the city would like uh, to guarantee sustainable services after uh, one provider will finish, so uh, the city would like to purchase the off station by the city. And uh, at the opposite sides of uh, potential partner uh, are needs of suppliers. It's a positive business case. So we was talking about uh, duration of the services. Uh, that's about next next topic. It's as I said, user friendly price. That mean uh, the pub, public. Uh, sorry, uh, the uh, private company identified they will need some subsidies. Uh, uh, they identified it's important unified business model because the city have to guarantee the fair trade conditions and the city have to provide for a private uh, partner allow parking at the land of the at the at the parking lot of the city and uh, last conditions or needs from public supplier was open charging solution uh, for roaming of services. So there was some words about uh, the plan of Prague for supporting the public charging station. And uh, thank you for your attention. Jeremy Ruby, thank you. Uh, I believe there will be some uh, space to discuss it further uh, during our uh, panel discussion later on. Thank you very much. Um, let me introduce our next guest. Uh, and uh, next guest comes from Norway, Karin Fefjord, head of Nording Edge Expo. We will be talking about how to link up to the business community. Uh, Karin, please. Um, yes, you can you pick, you pick one of those. Can you hear me? Yeah, there it is. I can at least see it on the small screen. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here today to present to you Nordic Edge and Nordic Edge Expo, which is the department that, uh, that I'm head of. Um, Nordic Edge is Norwegian's or Norway's official innovation cluster for smarter, more sustainable cities and communities. We are a not-for-profit uh, organization founded in 2015 and we are located in uh, beautiful Stavanger in, in Norway. You all know that the world is urbanized. People are moving to cities. Actually, 
One million people move to a city every week. Actually, when I Google it, I also find the number three million people, so somewhere in those lines, but a lot of people are moving into cities every week. And that causes challenges on environment and on climate. 75% of EU citizens, they live in cities. And this is projected to increase to 85% within 2050. And more than 65% of energy consumption and more than 70% of CO2 emissions come from cities. So, I know you know this, but I have to say it anyway. We need technology to solve these challenges. And we believe that that technology must be human-centric. Oh. Can I go back on this one? The red one, because I want to tell you, the red one's not working. Yes, we call that smart with a heart. Healthy, well-functioned cities, they need good infrastructure, mobility, energy, and uh, citizen involvement. As I said, uh, Nordic Edge situates in Stavanger, the fourth largest city in Norway. And Stavanger has been known internationally as the energy capital of, uh, of Europe, rooted in a strong position with a highly skilled population and access to technology. Um, the city has taken aim at developing a foothold in other industries. And you heard Gunnar also talked about that earlier today. Already in 2014, the first steps towards becoming a smart city engine in Norway were taken. It started with becoming a lighthouse city in the European Union Triangulum project. This formed a smart city roadmap, as you've also heard about before, and a smart city office in the local city administration. And the goal has all along been um, new jobs and transformation away from a reliance on the oil and gas industry. At the same time, uh, the city has always also aimed to become more environmentally friendly and responsible and to improve citizen services. So in other words, we want to create a smarter and more sustainable Stavanger region of tomorrow. Nordic Edge is a national cluster and we drive innovation, business development and societal change through cross-sector and cross-border collaboration. The cluster is a hub for all year-round activities for its 150 plus members from private and public sectors, from academia and finance, and we also have a large international network. We work together to scale, to test and to export solutions. Nordic Edge has four focus areas, as you can see, and they are all related to the challenges the world is facing. And in addition to this, we also focus on education technology, know-how and health in collaboration with our sister cluster, Norwegian Smart Care Cluster. And many of our projects, they go across several of, of these boxes. For instance, uh, the installation of car charging, as we've heard about today, in a city will both be mobility, it will be urban energy, city development and, of course, citizen engagement. So based on this, we are not a sector-focused cluster, but we collaborate and we co-create cross-sector and cross the Nordic and the European borders. And to deliver on these objects, Nordic Edge hosts a series of programs, events, collaboration proje projects and product development through this ecosystem. And as you can see, our Smart City Innovation Cluster is in the middle, in the hub, uh, with collaboration between its uh, 150 members. And it's a good mix of full-scale companies, startup and finance, <clears throat> academia, and so on. And they share experiences and they grow together. Big companies pave way for the small, and the small companies, they inspire the big. And some of the larger companies, for instance, uh, one of our owners, energy provider Lyse, they have established an innovation department where they help external startups and at the same time get access to projects and ideas in return without necessarily needing to fund or take internal risks. Nordic Edge in Oasis is our toolbox. It's a, it's a community, it's a culture, as well as an act, uh, actual co-working space. 
which bridges the gap between science, technology and practice. Nordic Edge in Oasis facilitates testing, piloting and commercialization of new technology and services through connecting innovators with investors, corporations, the academic community, authorities and community partners. Twice this year, Innoasis has hosted Nordic Fun Day. It's definitely fun, but it's all about funding. So this is an arena, both digital and physical, where startups have an opportunity to pitch to big European investors. I have a small film here. Uh, take a look. Does it start? Or do I have to press something? <laughs> you don't know. I can try the green one again. <coughs> oh no, oh, sorry. I thought it would start by itself. Okay, try the red one again. Uh, uh, oh, okay. It's not playing. Can so no. It is a film. It is a film. It's a very short film. I would love to, to show it to you. <laughs> you didn't know. I have two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please help. It is a film. It's not there. It should be in my presentation. I'm with the noise. Okay. Should I just move on? I'm sorry. I really would love to show you the film. Well, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 as I said, Nordic Fund Day is just a film about how we have a competition where startups uh, can apply. We choose 10 of them and, and we have, uh, have had an event where they actually can meet uh, big investors. And, and we've done this twice and so far actually, um, I think we've had 10 deals signed already. So, so things are happening in these fun days. So it's, it's a very good project and we're going to continue doing this and this would also and, and the and the startups come actually from all over Europe. So it's definitely also something that could be relevant for, for Czech companies or Czech startups. Okay, um, since I can't show you my film, then I have to move on and talk about Nordic Edge Expo, which is my department that I'm heading. And um, Nordic Edge Expo and conference, we host annual events at home and abroad. We've been to China three times. Uh, last time was digital. In May this year, we had 30,000 participants digitally from China, which was a very strange experience in these days. And uh, we've also been to North America at South by Southwest uh, with, with our programs digitally. But our main expo and conference is in uh, Stavanger. And I would like to give you an overview of the development of, of the event. Um, it was a humble beginning with 500 attendees in 2015. And Nordic Edge Expo has rapidly grown into being a valuable meeting place for smart city players across the Nordics and Northern Europe. And in recent years, around 200 co-organizers from across uh, the Nordics and beyond have ensured new insights uh, at, this, at this conference. And during uh, COVID, we obviously had to rethink so at Nordic Edge Expo 2020, more than 300 organizers, sponsors and co-organizers um, contributed to a fully digital version of, of Nordic Edge Expo. Uh, overall, more than 26,000 people from 51 countries participated in the event last year. And when almost everybody in the Nordics is talking about sustainable and smart city development, we actually put words into action by holding the seventh Nordic Edge Expo this year in September on an electric ferry docked in the city centre in the heart of Stavanger um, and we, we made a hybrid uh, conference. We, we had a fully scaled TV production um, for 8,600 participants as well as, as well as a series of physical events around the city centres for approximately 1,000 participants on site. So I would love now to show you also a very nice film from the event, but probably that won't work either. So I'll just, oh, there it is, nice. But there's no sound. Yes. Welcome to Nordic Edge Expo. 
What a week with live broadcasts, workshops and physical gatherings from the very heart of Stavanger. Together, leading players from academia and private and public sectors identified tomorrow's challenges and solutions. More than 200 organizations and partners joined Nordic Edge Expo 2021. But it isn't over. A lot of good work has been initiated and will continue to progress in the time to come. Thank you to all the attendees that participated from around the world. In total, 75 nationalities. We look forward to seeing you in Stavanger next year. beautiful venue, isn't it, city centre of Stavanger? Uh, it's a great place to host a conference about cities. And as you can see, our slogan this year was, or is, um, it's tomorrow, because we can no longer talk about the future. It is tomorrow. Uh, it's urgent and we have to act immediately. And we've discussed how we can, or how we do live in our cities and communities, um, how we should manage the green shift, and how we should reach the UN Sustainability Goal by 2030, because that requires comprehensive mobilization and change. So we looked ahead this year at Nordic Edge with leading players from uh, academia, the private and public sectors, and uh, we collaborated and we identified tomorrow's challenges, we discussed solutions, and maybe most importantly, we learned from each other. And our goal is to create a more sustainable tomorrow for all of us, leaving no one behind. So this was this year. We thought that COVID was ending, but now, as we can see, we don't know anymore. So, so what now? How will the conference look like next year and in the future? Um, I don't know, but I strongly believe that we constantly need to be on the move. We need to be innovative, we need to be brave, we need to be bold, and we need to think new. So next year's Nordic Edge Expo and Conference will not be like anything you've experienced before. We are still working on our strategy at this point, and unfortunately I cannot give you all the details, but we are investigating the possibility of moving the event to May uh, instead of uh, September, and I know May is not far away. And um, since Nordic Edge Expo is about cities, it's about citizens, and I said before we call that smart with a heart, we want also to maybe move the whole expo here to the city centre of Stavanger, closer to the people, and we look into several exciting and uh, maybe also surprising venues uh, and curated meeting places because we want people to meet, we want people to talk, we want it to be easy to find the right people to talk to. And that's why we also focus on the curated meeting places. And uh, this will also increase the international focus on cities and citizens in this a vibrant living lab environment. So uh, I really hope that we can launch the date and the place for Nordic Edge Expo very soon, and also the theme for our next conference. Um, I wish you all a warm welcome, obviously, to, to Stavanger next year, and I really hope that you will consider to joining us at Nordic Edge Expo next year. And if you have any questions or, oh, or comments, please don't hesitate to uh, contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the video. It was nice. It seems like Stavanger is not uh, a good place to uh, have an expo, a beautiful place to live, basically. Uh, and to move to. Thank you very much. Um, our next guest, uh, Miroslav Svitek from the Department of Transport Telematics, will be talking about the uh, cooperation between academia and uh, city. Please. First of all, I would like to thank for kind invitation. Hopefully my presentation will be soon, because I'm very happy that our university has also cooperation with Stavanger University. And I represent here Czech Technical University in Prague, Faculty of Transportation Sciences, and also uh, Czech Institute of Informatics, Robotics, and uh, Cybernetics. We are working in smart city more than 10 years, and from the beginning we understood 
smart city as a services for citizens with minimized resources and with optimized infrastructure, like transport infrastructure and energy infrastructure to achieve some sustainability and resiliency parameters. It is uh, important to mention that uh, sustainability has uh, three pillars. It is environmental, social, and economics, and there are a lot of methodologies how to provide uh, sustainable development, how to use uh, different criteria like healthy cities or environmental cities, and we can divide if the city is uh, more economy efficient, there is uh, more competitive, or whether it is uh, more social, then it is more inclusive, or environmental, there is more ecological. My group or uh, people around me, we are using artificial intelligence and we try to provide something like a digital twin of the city. So a digital twin of city is a very important part of uh, cyber, social, physical systems. And you can see on this uh, uh, short uh, video that uh, I don't know why, why the video is, is not not uh, visible. It is the center of uh, Strasbourg, and there should be some uh, some uh, digital twin. So the collected data were transformed into information, information to the knowledge. And knowledge is very important because it is why we uh, collect the data and why we try to manage uh, our cities. So this video is done by our students. It is uh, around about in uh, in Prague, in Czech Republic. And you can see that uh, the traffic situation is horrible, that there is a traffic jam. And the uh, roundabout is a bottleneck in this uh, transportation solution. So we proposed and we designed this another uh, solution of this uh, crossing with uh, traffic lights and with a uh, different structure. It is the similar traffic flow, and you can see that the congestions are better. So in the virtual space, we can do a lot of uh, decision-making scenarios. We can test, we can evaluate, and it is better than evaluated in real life. So in my presentation, I would like to speak about the uh, living laboratory. It was mentioned uh, that uh, something exists in Stavanger. My inspiration was in Berlin, because in Berlin, there is a RF laboratory and German companies and university decided that they will behave in this area like German expect to behave after 2050. So it is important that there are big companies, there are more than 100 startups and spin-off companies. Also, Technical University Berlin has a sit in this uh, living lab, and it is a very good environment for testing new technologies. There was also tested autonomous bus, uh, 3D printed and provided and developed by Deutsche Bahn. It was interesting for me that Deutsche Bahn developed uh, this autonomous bus, and we were inspired. Uh, we, we uh, received the inspiration from the Berlin, and our research group tried to build something similar step by step in the Prague. So we decided that uh, our living club could be Evropska Street. It is the street uh, from the Czech Technical University to Prague Airport, and we would like to solve our R&D project in this areas to find the synergies between energy, mobility, environment, and, and urbanism. We have now many projects. I am proud that uh, we received a uh, toucher from Technology Agency of the Czech Republic uh, project with the name uh, Transport Digital Twin of Evropska Street. I am also leader of National Cent uh, Competence Center for Artificial Intelligence and Cybernetics, a special sub-project application of artificial intelligence in mobility and in smart city. My colleagues uh, took uh, 
part in Maven project. It was big H 2020 project, and I would like also to mention a new pro bono project that uh, try to implement uh, digital uh, green deal in transportation and in in uh, building and, uh, and uh, in uh, civil engineering in the future. So they are very relatively big project, and we try to realize this project in Evropska Street. Other advantage of Evropska is that there is a car traffic, there is a tram traffic, but we have also a railway station, uh, Praha Vraslavin, that will be in the future mobility hub, hub of, uh, of Prague. And uh, our colleagues, together with me, we prepared for our railway operator first study about uh, smart railway station, because railway station can be also a very smart component of uh, smart city and smart mobility project. And also, Prague Airport could be a very smart component of mobility of Prague and of, of, of the Czech Republic. And we also published some papers about the smart airport and integration of smart airport into the city, city Prague. So it is uh, more technical details. We have a topology. Uh, part of our Evropska Street, we have a data platform, collected data, but what is very important, it is the ontology, how the data are used, and application of uh, artificial intelligence, and we use uh, multi-agent technologies that every smart component is represented by software, software agents, and software agents can negotiate in virtual space. Uh, some uh, some future development. So sometimes they cooperate, sometimes they compete, but they are able to find some solution and <coughs> very quickly react on the current situation. So it is good condition for resiliency of the city and for sustainability and for the changing of uh, environment. Uh, within the National Center of uh, Competence in Artificial Intelligence and Cybernetics, uh, we are developing some special urban simulation software, and we applied this software into our Evropska street, and we try to combine uh, traffic modeling, building modeling, environmental modeling, urban planning modeling, plus some external data, and model some use cases and try to visualize use cases with help of virtual reality or augmented reality. So it is some result of our work. So this uh, slide, was well, this model was done by, by Academy of Science of the Czech Republic and it is the temperature uh, close to uh, around about in Nevitska. I can similarly model some nanoparticles in this area because nanoparticles are very dangerous for for human health hopefully that nanoparticles will be visible soon so it, it on this slide it is uh, yes now i try to go back uh, right button and yes yeah, so, you can see here that it is caused by by cars, you know, by traffic flows, and in traffic jam you can see that there are a lot of nanoparticles in in some places. So it is a good instrument for analysis of this uh, living laboratory, and it is uh, the example of, of of the software. Hopefully. Oh. Ah. Yes, it is, uh, it is uh, visible. So it is our software that there are some traffic model, it is the environmental model, there is the urban model, it is energy model, and we prepared uh, different uh, scenarios. One scenario is a new secure building in uh, uh, 
in vítězné náměstí. It is uh, close to roundabout, and we can study the impact of this building on traffic situation and on environmental parameters and so on. So the digital twin of the city or digital twin of this laboratory, uh, living laboratory, can be good instrument for testing uh, new technologies. And it is also nice that every model was done by different experts. So this, uh, uh, this model was done by Faculty of Architecture of the Czech Technical University, traffic model by Faculty of Transportation Sciences, environmental model by Academy of Science, as I mentioned. And it is very nice for me as a leader of this project to see different uh, approaches to smart city, but the city is only one, and we try to combine these uh, different models. So it is the example of a presentation of our data that can be presented with help of a 3D model that uh, we have from operator ICT, or we have also some virtual reality models that you can see different approaches to to modeling tools. At the end of my presentation, I would like to mention our study programs because we have a double degree a smart city program together with Texas University of El Paso and everything is English. So our programs are fully open for Norwegian students and for Norwegian University. We have also the double degree in PhD study program and our university sign MOU with the Taiwan University of uh, Science and Technology. So smart city seems to be very interesting topic for, for students. And uh, our annual conference is a Smart City Symposium Prague, so you all are invited to next year in May, 26 and 27 of May for Smart Symposium, Symposium Prague. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, um, and let's get back to e-mobility e for uh, a little while. Um, I would like to welcome here Svenun Kvelo, Senior Advisor to the Norwegian Electrical Vehicle Association. Let's talk about how e-mobility can be the way of living and key to sustainability. Svenun, please, this is the clicker. Thank you. And you can choose the microphone. Oh, I can handle it to you, this one, please. Do you hear me now? Excellent. Thank you for the introduction. And it's been uh, really interesting to see all smart city development going on uh, today. Uh, my focus will be a little bit different. Uh, focus on, on e-mobility development in Norway and e-mobility e policies uh, in Norway. Uh, our organization is a non-profit organization. Uh, and we just uh, uh, passed 100,000 members. Uh, of EV drivers in Norway. We are an organization of 40 employees working on e-mobility, and our goal is to electrify transport as fast as possible. So meet our oldest member. This is Mr. Kåre Siltvik. When he was 99 years old, he decided to buy an EV. Uh, he uses it to, uh, to visit his 103-year-old uh, sister and do the daily grocery shopping. I also want to show you the video. Do you have some sound on it? This is from northern Norway, uh, where we had our winter test earlier this year. So as you can see, freezing temperatures down to minus 20 degrees. And as I saying here, really testing the limits of an electric car. is as far as you get north in Norway, Nordkap. So what we are saying that if you can drive an EV here, you can drive an EV everywhere. This is, this is our 
market shares for battery electric vehicles. I think this is important to state we don't count plug-in hybrids as EVs. We don't want them to be counted as EVs because uh, to get zero, to zero emission you need battery electric uh, vehicles. Um, here are all the, we know that cold is not a problem, uh, uh, age is not a problem. What about the countryside? If you're looking at the counties of Norway, you can see really, really high market shares everywhere, except maybe Finnmark. But even in Finnmark, it's the largest, um, um, it's, it's the largest uh, drivetrain uh, choice. Uh, but also I want to mention that this is an average of uh, privately owned um, bought cars, or private households, and companies. Half of, of Norwegian passenger cars are bought by companies, uh, typically leasing cars. Uh, and and uh, we have a taxation system that uh, have lower taxation for companies. So if you look at the household numbers, you can see we're on almost 90% battery electric throughout the whole country. And in Oslo in September, in 96% of all cars bought uh, in, in the city of Oslo it was battery electric in September from private households. So why is this uh, happening? Of course, 20% uh, of all road transport, of all emissions in the world comes from road transport. Uh, and uh, as we're seeing it, there's no way of reaching the Paris Agreement if we do not decarbonize the transport sector. So uh, in Norway, we have the most ambitious uh, target uh, or ZEV mandate in the world. In 2025, all new cars and light commercial vehicles uh, will be uh, battery electric or zero emission. And, the, and we're, we're gonna have no plug-in hybrids in in 2025. We are seeing now, it's really encouraging to see more and more countries coming up with seven mandates for 2035 and 2030. Uh, and we think that this development will go uh, really uh, quickly. Of course, we have some generous uh, subsidies in Norway uh, and, and uh, support has been key. We have a no purchase tax for electric vehicles, which is a Norwegian import tax for petrol and diesel cars. We have zero VAT. It's maybe about to be changed uh, quite quickly to introduce gradually uh, uh, VAT for electric vehicles as well. But so far we, we, we still don't have it. And we have a support scheme for light commercial vehicles. We also have on owning a car, you only pay 70% of the annual road tax and uh, owning an, an EVS company car, you have a lower, lower um, uh, benefit rate or, or tax rate than, uh, than a petrol car. Also, we have a lot of um, subsidies uh, or rebates when it comes to using the car, like in the toll roads, ferries and parking. The parliament has decided that EVs should only pay 50% of, of uh, average petrol and diesel car. Also, we have access to bus lanes, but uh, actually in, city, in the city of Oslo, there are so many electric vehicles that they had to, to stop those policies. So now only uh, you can only access bus lanes if you have an EV and you have at least one passenger. So I'll just show you how it works. This is the price before taxes for a, for a petrol car. And this is the price before taxes for an EV. It still costs more to make an electric vehicle, but the petrol car has 25% VAT and also quite a big purchase tax. So this is making the price of an EV and a petrol car equal when you go to the shop to buy one. Uh, and people are, with this system, preferring, of course, electric vehicles, as, as we have seen. So we're not buying uh, electric vehicles in Norway because we're more environmentally friendly than others. We are buying it because it makes economic sense. So the politicians have made uh, the rules to make us 
choose the more uh, environmental uh, car. We also have other laws and regulations, and I think this is uh, especially important in, in cities throughout Europe, Europe and for Prague. Prague. Um, when, you buy, when you build new buildings, you, they have to be charging ready, you have to build some parking spaces, and the parking spaces have to be ready to, to charge EVs. Also, if you live in an uh, apartment uh, uh, with, a parking, with a parking space and you don't have charge, access to charging, you can require charging. Uh, typically, this has to be uh, uh, allowed by the apartment board, but the new law, uh, which came into place last year, are saying that the apartment boards are not allowed to deny you uh, charging if you want to install it. You have to pay for it, but but you're allowed to to uh, put it up in in uh, in the public uh, charging garage owned owned by the apartment uh, board. Also, we have a strong public procurement. Um, I I want to mention Oslo because it's very special. Because if you want to if you want a package uh, to de uh, delivered uh, as uh, working in the city of Oslo. You have to make sure that this package is delivered by a zero emission vehicle. This will be from next year. Uh, and also we are having uh, strengthened public procurement on, on a national basis, where, the, where there will be minimum requirement for transport services already from 2022 and city buses in 2025. And, and of course it also helps that Looking, looking at the service, we, we, uh, we have service uh, every year uh, among our 100,000 members. So last year, 15,000 uh, members uh, answered the survey, showing that 95% of our members are satisfied or very satisfied with being an EV driver. So these high um, uh, satisfaction rates shows us that if you have changed to an electric vehicle from a petrol uh, or diesel vehicle, you don't want to go back. A little, about, a little bit about uh, the charging situation. Uh, we know that the, the number of electric vehicles have, uh, have uh, gone much quicker than we expected uh, and the market shares, but even with this development, we, have, we, have, we are seeing that uh, those who build uh, chargers are building faster than uh, the actual development of, of the deployment of cars. And also the number of high power chargers, which is more than 150 kilowatts, is, is expanding. Uh, so the number of chargers per car has actually, uh, or the number of cars per charger has, has actually gone down. Um, and this is with very little uh, public support. If you're looking at the, the public support we spent on buying cars, uh, the tax exemptions, this is a much bigger number than the, than the money we have spent on building a, a charging network. I think it's important to do some support, to have the initial network ready, but as long as you have built the initial network, people start to buy cars, then you have a commercial market for, for fast charging. We also see innovations. I really like this picture. This is a traditional uh, petrol station. But on, on the left side here, there are only, only EV chargers. So when you come to the, to the gas station or the energy station, you see electric vehicle chargers in the front. You also see uh, solar panels on the roof here. And here is a battery that helps uh, managing the, 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 uh, the grid load. So you can, always, you can always have high charging on your cars because as a customer, you want the charging to be done as, as quick as possible. Uh, and, and the battery helps uh, keeping up the pace without overloading loading the electrical grid. So as we see it in Norway, there are two remaining hurdles to reach 100% passenger cars in Norway. One is that uh, the incentives for plug-in hybrids are too generous. I mentioned that we have a high import tax for petrol cars, but for plug-in hybrids, uh, over half of them 
don't pay this import tax. And the other thing is that the, the company rules uh, makes it uh, makes the incentives less for companies buying electric vehicles than for private households. And if you compare the statistics, you see that privately owned cars have uh, the double market share of company-owned new cars. So this needs to be fixed. So I'm happy to say that in the budget, uh, the new budget that came yesterday, uh, they are fixing the problem of too generous uh, incentives for plug-in hybrids. So we expect next year, uh, even in January, February, the, the numbers to be even higher and close to 100%. I'm looking forward to the first day I can say that we have reached 100% in, in a city or in a region. And also a little bit about sustainability. We have heard many people say that uh, electric vehicles, they are not uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, but I think looking at the, the, mo the serious res research being done by this, this is from the International Council on, on Clean Transportation, you see that already uh, um, this is the uh, emission per gram in, in a lifetime, in the average in a lifetime of a car. You have to take into account uh, the emissions that comes from production, but also we heard that battery production is a problem. And of course it is with, with today's energy mix. Uh, it requires emissions to produce cars. But we believe the electricity mix will, we see the electricity mix going down, being much cleaner now than only uh, 10 years ago, especially in Europe. And the level of, uh, of uh, the amount of coal plants only comprise about 13% of the energy system in Europe, which already makes electric vehicle a lot cleaner than, than petrol cars, if you look at it in a lifetime perspective. Yeah, and in 2030, with, with the expected energy mix in 2030, it will be even more uh, environmentally friendly than the comparing petrol or diesel car. We still uh, see that in, in, uh, in um, areas like China and India, where coal is a large part of the electricity mix, it's not that uh, beneficial, but still it's even today it's more environmentally friendly when it comes to CO2 emissions. And if you also take into account uh, local pollution, uh, electric vehicles, of course, are much better than petrol and especially diesel cars. So I wanted to mention also, we in, in Oslo, we have uh, clean air policies. And we cannot do like go over to electric vehicles and the problem is solved. We also need to transform how we use, uh, how we move around. And I think it's in, in the city of Oslo is a good example of combining uh, EV policies with car free policies. We've seen they built the initial network of charging infrastructure, which has been very helpful. We have uh, tolling tariffs and parking fees used to both reduce traffic and incentivize zero emission technology. We have seen removal of street parking in the city center uh, and walking, cycling and public transport are prioritized in addition to um, incentivizing electric vehicles. Uh, so already now, one of four passenger cars in Oslo are battery electric, zero emission. We see improved air quality and combined with reduced car traffic. So having both policies are being a multiplier for better air, better condition, more livable city. Also, uh, electrification of transport goes beyond passenger cars. Uh, almost 60 of the ferries in Norway now, uh, of, the, of the car ferries, are being electric. Uh, we have electric planes, electric freight, and even excavators in Oslo. And this is a part of the innovation program in Oslo for, for procurements of new buildings. So just to, uh, to mention in, in the end here, 
when we look at the numbers now in, in the rest of Europe, we see in Norway we use two and a half years to go from 2% to 10% market share. In the UK, it only took one and a half years. In Germany, only one year. So development is going much faster in other countries than it did in Norway at the same time. Yeah. Also want to mention we are hosting the International Electric Vehicle Symposium in June uh, next year uh, with 10,000 visitors. So hoping to see some of you there. Uh, it's in June, so it's, it's a nice time to visit Oslo. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you for the insight. Seems like the future is somewhere else uh, than here, uh, probably. But uh, we'll see during the debate. I will be glad to address this topic uh, with the guests uh, about uh, the e-mobility in the Czech Republic. Uh, our next guest, uh, Anita, welcome back. Um, thank you. <laughs> and let's talk about uh, the uh, urban mobility in Oslo and uh, what's Oslo take on this topic. So please. The word is yours. Thank you. I guess you can hear me now. Um, Sveining has already spoken a lot about the e-mobility policy in Norway, so I would just like to make a few comments and remarks on what, what's the situation in Oslo right now. And then you can say that the national government is making it cheap to, to buy and use the EVs, and we as a city uh, municipality are facilitating its use on a daily basis. And as you understand, uh, with 70-80% uh, of all cars sold being uh, pure electric, the change is really happening there. Uh, so uh, what we need to do is to make sure that we have enough uh, charging uh, available. So we have two, some 2,000 charging points uh, publicly. Uh, we also have 80 points for fast charging. Uh, but our main support is also to give uh, financial support to housing cooperatives, etc., to set up charging uh, where people live. So we have supported actually up to, I must look at my notes, 60,000 charging points in, in housing cooperatives. So I think, you know, the private uh, car uh, issue is, is, is on the go uh, and the change is, is coming. So our focus now is, is more on the commercial uh, side, uh, we need to electrify everything, as Swainan said, from, from excavators to everything, but we're working with trucks and vans, uh, electric taxis, uh, the buses, um, and also shared mobility uh, operators. So we do have different incentives for, for companies also to install charging for, for vans, uh, for uh, taxi owners to also install uh, charging uh, where they live. We have a specific uh, charging stations in the city for, for taxis, and we're also now testing. I think uh, Svanin could probably know more about this, but uh, um, different uh, wireless charging for taxis to make it more efficient uh, for the users. We're also working on um, trying to have most of the logistic uh, in the city center emission-free. Uh, so we're uh, establishing different city hubs where companies, different companies then can uh, reload into uh, electric vehicles or, or even bikes. So um, the issue is very much on, on how to get the transformation on the bigger vehicles. And the most challenging area, I guess, is, is the heavy duty vehicle. We see now some models coming into the market. Uh, but we see that there's also a big demand from some big companies that want to be uh, first movers on this, but the, the models are not coming into the market quickly enough. But we hopefully will see a, a bigger change also uh, on the heavy duty uh, vehicles as we go along. Um, so we are lucky, of course, in Norway to have hydropower as a base for our electricity that has made us a first mover. But as Svenning said, we also see now a big uh, move elsewhere, and, and we really hope that um, this could uh, could really accelerate in the years to come, also on, on the heavier uh, vehicles, so that the market is bigger and, and more models uh, are available for us. Um, yes, I don't think I shall uh, 
bore you with all the, the numbers, but this is really a, a policy that we believe in and, and we hope to be able to reduce uh, the emissions from transport by electrifying as much as possible, but also, as uh, I said before, focusing on the other modes of transportation and, and reducing also the number of vehicles uh, that are operating within the, the city centre. So I think I will just uh, stop on, on that note. Uh, uh, thank you, Anita. You will be joining us today for for uh, um, for the rest panel or not? Um, um, no, I'm no. afraid I have to leave for another meeting. Ah, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, for your for your take on it. Thank you very much. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, let's let's continue because uh, we are just on time, which is great. Um, uh, that's why we can uh, move uh, uh, forward. I would like to um, uh, reintroduce uh, Gunnar Crawford, and let's talk about smart smart energy and circular economy. I think it's a great topic for our later uh, debate as well. Let me just find a clicker for you. Thank you for having me back. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about the softer sides of smart. So it will be uh, less uh, greenness for this slide set, but uh, I wanted to share some, uh, some of our learnings with you. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail of the, of the roadmap of the smart city, which I did previously to, today, but I just want to point out that when we started working on this, Everyone was expecting us to dive into the technology, and we more or less did. Uh, we tried to manage the expectations. Uh, we went, uh, we, we started out with the hard technology, and you see a lot of examples uh, of that uh, on the slide. Uh, doing everything from uh, sort of typical uh, charging infrastructures, uh, uh, smart wayfinding, we did uh, and do uh, sensors in st uh, street drains, we've done measuring of uh, the distance between bicycles and cars, uh, a lot of data-driven projects, and we even have uh, open data initiatives, right? But what we saw after a couple of years is that this needs to be combined and developed together with some, with some other skill sets. So actually, uh, we moved on to the more soft skills uh, and the soft approaches. Uh, uh, probably not a surprise, but uh, we saw that we needed better methods of problem identification and the ways of doing co-creation. Uh, we didn't always understand the problem correctly. We, uh, very often, we defined the problem from sort of a city administration perspective, maybe not from a citizen perspective. Uh, and we started solving it sort of the wrong, wrong way around. So uh, what we introduced was uh, models and uh, methodology for service design. Uh, we added artists into our city planning. Uh, we even established a co-creation house to gather our colleagues to teach them the skill sets needed to go out and work together with our uh, uh, citizens and our businesses. And we did various types of uh, agile piloting, as we call it, various types of procurement, uh, which had a higher degree of involvement. We even established local presences. We went out, we had our uh, camper, we, did, uh, uh, we had containers, we were out there speaking to people. What we saw was that uh, we got to be much better on, on point. We found the problems. We knew how to better solve the problems, but the methods didn't scale. So uh, we also understood that we won't be able to teach all our colleagues. Also in Stavanger, there's a lot of uh, people working in the municipality, 12,000 to be uh, uh, correct, and that's a, quite a large employer, uh, 12,000 people. And we saw that we need to go into cooperation with the university to be able to solve uh, this uh, and, and to build the skills for the future. So we went together with the university. We created uh, two co uh, one co-creational uh, class and one service innovation and service design class as uh, means of getting uh, people with existing jobs 
uh, to go to school and learn the additional skill sets needed. Not having to spend another 10 years in school, but do it within a semester or two, and then sort of build your competency and then take it back into the city. This is really working well. Uh, so we apply this now uh, to all kinds of projects. Just a few examples behind me. Uh, we, th this is a better way of, for us to, to sort of get close to the citizens. It doesn't really matter which age group. All have different requirements, I would say. Uh, but we, we do the process with mapping and insights. We do the idea and concept phase. Uh, and we do uh, the prototyping and testing together with the citizens. And we do it on uh, existing services, uh, things we want to further develop, things we want to test that we copied from somewhere else. But we need to have a sort of a local flavor, a local test. It might not be applicable for us, so we, again we have to do it, but we have to do it fairly fast. We can't do sort of the big design processes from scratch every time. But we should uh, at least explore what really drives our citizens. Uh, and as a, a small, kind of cute example uh, was uh, within the COVID field. Um, after having run tons of processes uh, like this, actually the marketing department or communication department of the city came to us and said, ah, we're not hitting the target when it comes to young people and uh, COVID information. Uh, can you help us? And we thought, it's strange to ask us. We work with smart city stuff and smart city development. But actually, they said they saw that we had such a great success in the way we did our processes. So uh, we, we actually run it. Uh, we ran it on a sort of communication with young adults. And they gave us a lot of interesting feedback. Uh, they wanted us to use dialect in our communication. They wanted us to use dark humor. They wanted us to uh, collaborate uh, more closely. And we did. We, we made various concepts together with the citizens, and then we launched it, and it was a great success. Suddenly, the, the, the youngsters felt included in the debate, and it felt relevant for them. And this was a very tough debate internally in the, in the city. And when it comes to... Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I should translate this. <laughs> Yeah, so, so no, it's, it, it, it's, it's just talking to the kids about, uh, uh, well, when you see a girl that follows the, the, the rules, oh, sorry, uh, you get really excited. I'll, I'll stop there. I'll, I'll leave it to our imagination. But anyhow, it, it, it kind of went into a discussion internally about the way we communicate from a city perspective, and it actually opened some doors for us for future projects. But we've been refocusing without leaving tech behind. And I knew I was also going to talk to some of the best people in the uh, sort of the smart city tech uh, side here. So I brought along some technology also. I, I always aim to please, right? So uh, just uh, a few notes on the, on the technology that we are still doing and why it's a little bit different for us this time around than, uh, than previously. We do drones. We are part of a European uh, drone project, which is extremely ambitious. Uh, we are actually going to have a, a doctor and or a patient up in the air by the end of this year or be beginning of next year. And these are major regulatory issues when it comes to this. And the drone behind me, as you see, it's uh, not just a PowerPoint, it exists. We had it in, uh, during the Nordic Edge Expo this year. We're not allowed to fly it. There's two seats and none of the people sitting there needs to be a pilot because it's autonomous. So imagine every hurdle we have to figure out to get this up in the air when it comes to law and everything, right? And security, risk assessments, and so on. But that's actually our part. This is the city's part. Because we have to find out, will it ever be publicly accepted? Will it uh, ever be so that people will accept to be up in it themselves? Will they uh, mind these flying overhead? Uh, but then again, we're in Stavangers, we're used to all the, all the helicopters going back and forth to the platforms in the North Sea. So maybe people are more positive in Stavanger? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, we're going to start out flying them across uh, the, sort of the, the, the waterways, and after a while we'll have to fly across uh, land. So let's see what happens. But it's the same with all the other technology project, uh, projects we do. Uh, we are going back and trying to sort of figure out the needs. Uh, but there's also happening in parallel with this and this more softer approach, we are really uh, seeing the new data streams. 
Uh, and you guys have been talking about uh, uh, open data, public data earlier today. And for us, this is getting to be quite a big success. We have uh, established our uh, open data portal. It's been up, uh, up and running for three, four years now. Uh, and uh, for us, we, we did it first and foremost because in Norway, you have to do it by law, so you should be transparent and open. But it doesn't mean that everyone is doing it, but that's uh, the principle at least. But we w want to do it for the transparency towards the citizens, towards the businesses. But we would also very much like to have business development on top. And I know this is kind of the holy grail. Uh, we've been talking, I've been talking to several people here about how do we find the right use cases? How do we inspire others to use the public data? The taxpayer generated data, which it really, really is, right? Uh, so we're still working on that. But we are also seeing like the, the third use case for us. It's actually easier for us to go to our own open data source to get data for our projects than having to ask all our colleagues, please, can I have your data uh, from you to do my next project? So even if the open data structure doesn't contain everything, it contains enough to be a sort of value creation with, within the municipality. Uh, and also, there's uh, just a sketch of the, our data lake down in the corner. That's the sort of the other, I would say, success going on at the moment. All, uh, all data systems in the city of Stavanger now have to uh, either move their data sets into the data lake, the centralized data lake, or have to be, it, they have to be connected. And the whole idea is that we have to go away uh, from the old vendor lock-ins, where we have to pay for our own data to access our own data. We need to have it more centralized. And the moment that happens, and it has happened with a lot of data sets uh, so far, it's so much easier to share it back out as open data. The ones, of course, data that we can share. We can't share everything. Uh, there's another thing which uh, is happening these days, which uh, is back to the citizens. So there's a lot of focus on my data, so my personal data. We, we are running some projects, but we have one big struggle. Because the citizens are sharing too much data with us. And we're trying to teach them that they shouldn't. Uh, at least we need to have a good discussion around what they should be sharing. And they have to understand, understand the consequences of what they're sharing, when, and, and sort of their responsibility. So we are doing several projects. Briefly mention uh, one of them. If you see down uh, to the, uh, to, uh, in the corner, we have something called iHeart Vigo. Vigo is a, is a kind of it's a, it's a place in Stavanger where we do uh, a project using uh, health wristbands or sports uh, watches, gathering data from the citizens. And we're doing it because nobody else wants to do it, because it's, high, it's a high-risk project. It's got everything to do with GDPR. But we are trying to contain it. We are trying to have a fruitful discussion with our citizens. And of course, I, I try to avoid going to jail. But still, it's, it's, it's part of this, because if we don't do it, we know that Facebook, Google, and everyone else does it. But the city administration has never had the opportunity to use this data for anything good. So uh, just as an example there, before you get too worried, uh, the citizens in this project, they use Polar sports watches, and, and you can, uh, we only monitor them when they say start and stop. Uh, so they know what they're sharing, and we discuss it, and we use it for city development, and of course, public health. So uh, rounding off, uh, all this gives us data which can be made into new services, but still we are searching what is the best new services to be had out of our open data. Uh, it could be input into our digital twins, it could be into our uh, citizen platforms, it could be into our climate uh, calculations and climate mapping. Uh, and we do all of this, but we still haven't found sort of the, the, the best use case, uh, case ever. But we might not ever find it, because this is ongoing development, right? So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thanks again. I would like to touch upon this topic uh, in, uh, in a few short whiles. Um, meanwhile, let me introduce our another speaker. He's online. His name is Jiří Petrka and he's a project manager of Smart Prague, and let's talk about smart energy and circular, circular economy. Yiri, if you can hear us and see us, the floor is yours. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about Smart Prague and the uh, city's uh, energy savings.
Okay, it's working. Uh, let's start with the Vision uh, 2030. The Prague uh, City Council has authorized a uh, climate uh, commitment which uh, include reducing uh, CO2 emissions uh, by uh, 45 percent uh, to year 2030 uh, versus uh, year 2010 CO2 uh, production. These goals are achievable also thanks to the huge potential of energy saving uh, in building some uh, to reach uh, these goals, so we have uh, created many energy, uh, many energy projects uh, and uh, I have chosen uh, the most interesting uh, project uh, with uh, I would like um, to introduce you in the following uh, slide. Uh, first one uh, is um, a building energy system. Uh, City of Prague owns uh, more than uh, 1,200 uh, buildings and uh, city districts own another uh, 5,000 buildings. Uh, this is a, a huge uh, amount uh, of a building and uh, we needed uh, uh, to know which uh, buildings have biggest energy uh, potential. Uh, we have uh, developed a uh, unique methodology in collaboration with uh, the Czech Technical University in uh, Prague. Uh, methodology uh, enable rating uh, the sustainability of building uh, uh, of uh, various uh, energy measures <coughs> and uh, allows qualified uh, decision making about innovation investment into, uh, into the building. Uh, there uh, you can see example uh, of uh, building energy system methodology used on apocentrum Shutka. Uh, there is a created uh, for each building, uh, the building art, which is in the center in the, in the slide. Uh, uh, which keeps uh, measures on the envelope of the building and uh, uh, some technology measures. Uh, and on the base of the calculation, uh, we ca get uh, recommendations uh, where we can uh, save the most. And this uh, resolution you can see on the right side. Uh, in this case, uh, the methodology recommends the roof installation and uh, in uh, uh, technology measures, uh, we can install the LED lighting and uh, efficient uh, source of the heat and so on. Uh, next project is uh, energy management. Uh, this is a, a, like a basic tool for monitoring energy con consumption and uh, application non-investment organization measures. Uh, energy management is implemented uh, in a 16 buildings uh, such as a school, study or houses, the museum and uh, observatory which is shown on the right side of, of, the, of the slide in the picture. Uh, we are monitoring uh, all the commodities uh, like uh, gas, water, electricity and uh, heating uh, with uh, non-wired sensors. Uh, which you can see uh, below the picture of the observatory. Uh, these sensors are communicating with the uh, non-wired technologies like the LoRa, Sigfox, or narrowband. Uh, on the base of the energy monitoring, we found out water leakage, expensive uh, electricity, and also expensive gas tariff. So and uh, we uh, save every year more than uh, 50,000 uh, euro and uh, one ton of CO2. Uh, next project is a uh, light project. Uh, we call it healthy class. We are measuring CO2 in schools. We have installed sensors of indoor environment to each classroom in high school, which is so, uh, shown on the right side of the slide. 
Uh, there are 40 sensors which are measuring concentration of CO2, humidity, and temperature in classrooms. Also, the sensor is uh, below the picture of school. Uh, high concentration of CO2 caused uh, tiredness, lack of concentration, and uh, headache. On the base of the World Health Organization today, high concentration of CO2 contributes spreading uh, COVID virus as well. And uh, teachers can regulate the ventilation through checking the light indicator on sensor. Uh, when a sensor, uh, if sensor is blinking red, uh, 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 red color concentration of CO2 is high and teacher uh, can ventilate by windows till the sensor is blinking green and now it's concentration of CO2 low. And also uh, teachers can see notification about the high concentration of CO2 on their mobile phone. Uh, last uh, project uh, is called energy saving uh, using the EPC method. Uh, EPC is a shortcut of energy performance uh, contrasting is a type of uh, contract uh, when the supplier uh, guarantees uh, contracted savings to a customer. If the guaranteed savings are not achieved, uh, the supplier compensates the difference to the customer. The investment is paid by supplier of the solution in advance, and it is paid back from the savings during the uh, 12 years uh, contract. Uh, ener uh, energy savings using the EPC method is implemented in uh, six different types of the building, uh, which are shown, uh, shown on the picture. The municipal house, exhibition grounds in Holeshovice, uh, municipal police, uh, directorate, uh, the Oliva Children's Sanatorium, Aquacentrum Shutka, and uh, Technical Road Administration Complex. Uh, we implemented there the standard technologies. Uh, for example, is it, uh, is it a replacement of existing lighting fixtures uh, with the cost saving flex panel, water saving with the use of the water flow controller. We also installed uh, the thermostatic radiator head. And uh, the last standard technology is a, a new, new, more efficient, efficient source of the heat. Uh, special technologies implemented in some specific buildings is, uh, is, for example, the energy saver, which is shown on the right side, like a gray box. And this uh, technology adjusts the voltage uh, fluctuation and other parameters of electricity. This technology extends the uh, lifetime of electricity devices and can save 15% uh, of uh, electricity consumption. Also, we install uh, the photovoltaic panels, which produce green electricity for direct uh, use uh, on the roof in the Olivova Sanatorium. Uh, and next uh, special technology is the preheating of pool water with waste shower water using a heat pump. This is in, uh, located in Apartment in Chutka and uh, Last special technology also located in Apartment uh, Shutka is the cleaning and re reusing pool water. Uh, this technology uh, can save more than 30% uh, of water consumption. So this project can save uh, 4 million uh, euros and uh, more than 37 tons of CO2. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Yuri. Uh, we'll be definitely touching upon uh, the EPC projects, which are uh, quite uh, interesting, uh, so to say, developmental, developmental part of city sustainable uh, living. Uh, our next guest, uh, let me introduce Anna Sapota, Vice President for Governmental Affairs, Eastern Europe North. And let's talk about holistic resource system. Um, 
Anna, let me just yeah, find you your clicker and microphone, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are not sleeping yet. After lunch, this is always difficult. Uh, so I would like to discuss today a, a bit less sexy topic than electromobility because I will be talking about waste. But uh, for all of us following the discussion from the morning, uh, we could see that the waste management was also mentioned several time, uh, times as a part of, uh, of smart city concept and one of the tasks which, which has to be dealt with. So I'm representing Tomra. Tomra is a privately held company. We are working for, we are having almost 50 years of experience and working uh, for various industries, food industry, recycling and mining and collection. Uh, today I will be talking about recycling. This is the, the topic of the report I want to introduce to you. Uh, why? Because we have a lot of challenges, which we already discussed, and carbon emissions uh, are one of them. And we believe, as Tamara, that the moment to discuss only about recycling rates already passed, and we have to start to look uh, broader on the topic, and emis carbon emissions are one of the things which we definitely have to consider talking about waste management systems. And just to make it more clear, at least 50% of emissions responsible for climate change are embodied in things we use and consume every day. So it's really a lot, and this is the, the energy we, we are potentially wasting. And to whom we discuss? We, we discuss with all types of stakeholders, various audiences, like today here I'm talking to you, but we are trying to reach out to recyclers, governments, municipalities, waste management companies, everyone who are interested in, in the topic simply. And what I would like to tell you is the report which we published this year. From deadly heat waves and burning wildfires to violent floods and storms, climate change affects almost every aspect of our lives and our children's futures. To prevent the worst case scenario and create a future with less waste and fewer CO2 emissions, we need to build an economy where resources are kept in circulation for as long as possible, then fed back into the system through collecting, sorting, and recycling. The optimal way to do this is to make use of holistic resource systems. An integrated approach to waste management that takes advantage of three processes that already exist. Together, these processes can increase the amount of plastic recovered for recycling and help advance closed loop supply chains. These are the three pillars are separate collection, deposit return schemes, and mixed waste sorting. And to understand further... One element of holistic resource systems is mixed waste sorting. A process with the ability to recover the resources that the other two miss. Doubling the amount of plastic we collect. Right now, most of our plastic waste ends up in the ocean, in the ground, or burned instead of being recycled. If we can change that, we can save the planet and our future. So this is the general concept, which I would like to develop a bit further. Why we are talking about holistic resource system, why we want to talk about holistic approach to waste management, because we believe and we checked together with a British consultancy company Unomia that integrating the existing waste management practices, best practices, which are designed to, to uh, answer to regional challenges can save for us 2.76 billion tons CO2 emissions. 
And I don't know if you can imagine how much it is. I cannot. So luckily, Unomia made it for me, saying that it's equivalent of removing more than 600 million passengers' vehicles, not EV vehicles, from the roads on a yearly basis. So it's really a lot. And these are not the new things. This is not what we have to come up and start from the scratch. These are the things which, which already exist, the practices which are already in place. The first one is deposit return system. As we are talking uh, on the event uh, organized by the Embassy of Norway, uh, and this is the, the, where Tomra started in 1972. So nearly 50 years ago, exactly from being part of the deposit return scheme for, for the beverage packaging, at that time refillable packaging. Now we see that this is the practice which not only helps you to reduce littering for, for single way uh, packaging, one way packaging, but also allows you to close the loop for plastic and for metal, meaning close the resources loop where from 100 of virgin PET bottles put in the system, on average in Europe, we would collect in deposit scheme 90 out of 100. And in next rounds of recycling, we are able to have up to 208 new bottles with the recycling content. Then we are having separate collection, probably something which I don't need to explain you what it is. We are having this very standard fractions of waste, municipal waste like paper, glass, organic, textiles, e-waste. What is maybe not necessary, it's plastic separate collection. We are having here the uh, representative of city of Stavange, which this bold decision was taken and the plastic is not uh, selectively collected. It's, it's collected together with the mixed waste and then through the uh, well-prepared and equipped sorting facility, it's retrieved for recycling. So what we believe is extremely important is the third pillar, mixed waste sorting, the one which was also uh, why, why a bit more uh, developed in the movie, because mixed waste sorting, whatever it's left, of the residual waste or pre-incineration mixed waste sorting is the tool to capture everything which was not captured in the previous stages. So whatever we didn't put into deposit system and were not able to collect through selective collection, we are able to retrieve still through mixed waste sorting. And in terms of packaging, which for us are now one of the targeted materials, we can more than double the amount of plastic packaging for recycling. So these three pillars for us are the modern approach, holistic approach to waste management, which will impact littering, GAG benefits, and will allow us to reach the recycling targets of EU. And there are three case studies. I will not go into details, but we were, we were calculating and showing the uh, positive effects of implementation of deposits re return scheme in Lithuania. There is the uh, AVER in, in the Netherlands with mixed waste sorting of municipal waste, where uh, the results were much higher than anyone expected. And we are having the example of Sweden with pre incineration sorting, where the, the idea is developing. As we can see, there are already some realized projects and new under construction coming. So, which allows us to again show very clearly the GHG benefits. And the study itself, I think it's extremely interesting, and I encourage you to have a look and to read it and if if you are interested i'm happy to answer to any questions you may have now or later thank you very much thank you anna uh thank you very much uh, uh and i will be joining us in a couple of minutes for the panel discussion i would like to encourage you slido is active hashtag sharing future please feel free to ask questions i will definitely address them uh, in a while. And last but not least, um, let me introduce um, our speaker, Lukasz Ferkel, University Center for Energy Efficient Buildings. 
Lukash, please. The clicker, I will give it to you straight up. There you go. And microphone, please. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon. So, last, it's always a challenge. But I hope everyone is already awake from the lunch. So, um, uh, first let me introduce our uh, institute, uh, University Center for Energy Efficient Buildings of the Czech Technical University in Prague. That's quite a long name. Uh, we are quite a new part of, uh, of the uh, Czech Technical University. Um, and with uh, about 160 people in staff plus about 100 students, we have about 200 projects every uh, year, uh, mainly with uh, industry and municipalities. Uh, so my, my topic uh, is uh, cooperation with companies, which is kind of general. So when I was thinking what to, what to present uh, are, of course, projects that have already some real implementation, some real impact on the society. Um, first uh, project here was, uh, was a Horizon 2020 project with uh, partners mainly from uh, the Netherlands, but also all around uh, Europe. And it was focused on deep reconstruction of single family houses uh, and possibly also residential buildings in general. Um, the problem we are facing, uh, especially in uh, multifamily houses, is that um, um, in 1950s, after the, the Second World War, many buildings were built as provisional buildings, so to say. Uh, so they were expected to last 10 or 20 years. So now, after 70 years or so, they really need to be reconstructed. And the situation is the same all around Europe. Uh, for single family houses, it's kind of easier, but for uh, multi-family houses, there's usually a very difficult uh, structure of ownership and uh, the best solution would be to demolish the building and build a new one because the buildings built in 1950s were really not built to last forever. But imagine moving out, I don't know, 20 families out and say, bye, that was your house, we will demolish it and build a new. So in five or seven years you can move in back. So that's not possible. So the idea is to provide means for deep reconstruction while you can still live in the house. So what you basically do is you build a new house around the old house. Um, but the advantage is that you can still be there. Uh, the companies that are uh, performing this type of reconstruction in um, the Netherlands or in Belgium, Great Britain, and other countries, they can refurbish a single family house in eight hours. So in the morning, you just drop in, drop the keys to, uh, to the construction company. And in the evening, you come and you have new facade, new windows, new door, new heating system, new electrical networks, uh, everything installed. Uh, next project, um, I see here Tomáš Vácha, who was uh, part of this project at our institute. Uh, we were trying to find out a way to, uh, to build a community energy system. In the time we were starting the project, we did not know it's called community energy uh, system. Community energy is a buzzword that... Uh, we discovered later. Uh, originally, we uh, called it smart grid uh, projects or uh, microgrid projects. Uh, the interesting thing is that these projects uh, were not uh, done in cooperation with municipalities, but with private companies. So 
Here in the Czech, Czech Republic, there are private companies who by themselves, themselves see uh, community energy projects as their business advantage. So there are already uh, projects being built. Uh, some of them are listed on the, uh, on the slide. And um, it's uh, really an interesting experience uh, because uh, community energy systems is something that um, does not really fit into current legislation. So you have to, one, one thing is the technical solution, which is, well, not easy, but doable. And the other thing is the legal solution, which is uh, not easy and sometimes not doable. So you have to somehow slip into the current legislation to overcome all the obstacles, but we somehow managed. Um, yeah, some some other pictures of our other projects. Uh, they include, uh, as as we are focused on buildings as uh, as such and on on uh, on districts. Um, so one of the examples is the wooden facade system, which is now used by the Subterra company under uh, under license. Uh, indoor environment quality sensors. Uh, I think the, the the sensors that were presented in the last in the presentation of the uh, OICT were based on on our hardware platform. Uh, organic ranking cycle engine. Uh, it's not really an innovation. Uh, ranking cycle has been known for 190 years now or so, but our is very small one. <laughs> so. Uh, a small one, a simple one. We wanted to build. build a, uh, it's a kind of a, a CHP plan, combined heat and uh, power uh, uh, plant, and uh, uh, it's uh, it has also some commercial success. We have a spin-off company which is uh, uh, producing those um, plants. And the last example there is the Phoenix uh, experimental building. Uh, it's, it's, the company is called Phoenix, so it's not that the building was burned down and then rebuilt, so it's just called Phoenix. And uh, we, uh, it has been uh, uh, in operation for eight years now, maybe. And by collecting the data, we can, it's, it's a fully, elec fully electric house, so uh, we, uh, we are trying to find out how uh, fully electric houses, uh, houses behave. So uh, the, these are the, the examples uh, of, uh, of single projects, uh, but I, I have to say what, what is important, uh, what we see now, for, especially for municipalities, is to really have a concept and conceptual use of, of, of those innovations. Uh, in, in, in my experience, when we talk about smart city or smart energy systems here, we really talk about those gadgets. Uh, so uh, when we say smart city, you imagine smart sensor, smart, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, crossing pedestrian or smart bench, smart bench, yes, that's something we make as well. Uh, but that's, that's not really smart. <laughs> uh, smart is something that, that operates together, uh, that is networked, uh, with something that contributes to, uh, to sustainability, to um, uh, resilience of the, uh, of the city. Uh, so, having gadgets all around the city does not, or village, or uh, real estate development project does not really mean that uh, that uh, the system is smart. So uh, that's my kind of final message. Uh, the gadgets are fine; they uh, push. Uh, uh, 
uh, our knowledge and our lives forward, but uh, they always have to work together. So, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's move to our final panel discussion. Uh, Lukas, you don't have to leave. Uh, if I ca can uh, kindly ask organizers to bring up some chairs, maybe, uh, that we can start uh, the debate. And before, before we start, uh, a short organizing n notice. Uh, after the discussion, uh, it would be great if you could gather here and take a, a, a photo. And at 3.30, there will be shuttle uh, ready to take uh, those of you who have to leave to the airport. So after 3.30, uh, and there will be shuttle ready for you guys for, to the, for those who have to have to go. And uh, uh, please, gentlemen, uh, join us here. And, and what Lucas said that it's about the ecosystem. It's not about uh, single smart solutions. I think he finished off with something that I would like to start with today. Uh, and um, uh, I would like to invite also Karin here and Anna. And we have Yuri on. Uh, on the on the void uh, zoom screen. So uh, if you could uh, just uh, take your seat, gentlemen. Unfortunately, I would like to discuss more. We'll have only 30 minutes, but let's 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 make the best out of it. Um, you, you've got the microphones. I think we have said thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and let me start. Oh, sorry, I just put this. Let me start with uh, with broad question again for for all of you. I don't see you uh, online. He's not. OK, so um, it's only us then. It's, it's even better that we can talk. We, we were discussing uh, hybrid, hybrid uh, debates, uh, yeah. the utility of hybrid debates. Anyway, you, uh, you, uh, all of you touched upon. We have one more issue. Oh, yes, OK, of course. I can get the chair. No, 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 please. Don't, no. <laughs> Let's. I can stand, to be honest. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you, good sir. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, I hope we are all in a new frame, at least the, the, the main panelist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for, for your insights. I would like to start off with a broader question because you touched upon different topics, but I think what connects them is this ecosystem building. And uh, there is no smart develop, uh, future, smart city development without the ecosystem. We can do some, some, uh, some uh, uh, points from, from what you, you were telling, but without the connection, it won't work. And my first question is how to accelerate those ecosystem uh, in terms of growth. E-mobility, uh, waste management, uh, the cooperation uh, throughout the systems, and maybe even if you're talking how to engage the right stakeholders, Karin, into, into basically pushing forward uh, the, the same cause for everybody. So please, if I, can, uh, if I can give you the word, you can start um, anyone. Just how to accelerate the ecosystem growth. Oh, that's a very good question because you have different stakeholders. You have the private sector, you have the exactly. public sector, you have uh, academia and, and you have finance. But I believe in finding good meeting places for them. And um, in our smart city innovation cluster, we, we make meeting places and we accelerate uh, events for, for people to, to meet. Um, so... Uh, <sighs> It's, it's both easy and difficult at the same time, but I think bottom line is, is to, to bring people together and let them share their uh, knowledge, try to find solutions together, cross sectors and, uh, and of course also cross borders, because we have a lot to learn from each other from different sectors and also from different countries. Mm -hmm. Different sectors, uh, different stakeholders that often mean different interests. And uh, um, uh, if we take uh, uh, your presentation to account, uh, circular, cir circular uh, waste uh, management, uh, can we accommodate those different interests? I, I think that. Is they it there? Will, yeah, they yeah. Okay, so I think that it, there are no different interests in, in reality, but we have to only correctly define what we need and look for because. Uh, if we are talking about waste management, if we are talking about circular economy, these are the topics which are in common interest. Like circular economy is is a method in theory or in, in, in its 
definition the method to make companies grow, to make the economy grow, right? So it's not that we will make some spendings and create the, the trouble. It's just the man mindset a bit which have to be changed. And that's why the initiatives where you can discuss with the others and we, you, where you can emerge, it's, it's like in my presentation, we said, okay, these are not the new things. We are talking about the best practices which are already existing, but many, many countries are still struggling because they don't know how to combine it or we do not have examples, or the examples are a bit too expensive, or the examples are not in the legal framework. So to accelerate, we have to define what we want to achieve and to grasp all these strings together to make a line which we will pull together. Mm -hmm. Lukáš? Yeah, I, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> It's quite a difficult question, and I think honestly that we don't know exactly the answer uh, yet. Uh, but the experience is that um, uh, it's really about sharing. Uh, yes, yeah, as, as, as my as, as the ladies already mentioned, <laughs> sharing the knowledge. It's it's very important. Uh, promoting good examples. So uh, lead by examples uh, and. Uh, create the environment for uh, for innovation for for new solutions, because you can what you can do of course is is to to force some uh, measures or uh, some projects from above, but if they emerge uh, from uh, from down from the market, and they work like ideal sustainable solution is something that does not need to be subsidized, does not need to be regulated by law and just exists so so uh, uh, to create such an environment where, where where the solutions can emerge and can work uh, in the market is the best solution of course it's not possible in uh, in every field uh, there are some examples uh, there are some examples where it cannot be achieved like uh, waste management i think <laughs> it cannot work without regulation without laws but uh, yes so to uh, uh, yeah, maybe so. So three things: if 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 the if the project needs to be uh, f uh, somehow enforced, do it. <laughs> if uh, if not, it's even better. Uh, then create uh, an environment uh, for for new solutions and talk together and uh, share your experience, your examples. Thank you, Anna. You wanted to add something? Yeah, I, I'm always doing this. So sorry <laughs> to make so many ad votum. But I had this thought that um, it's not exactly that we cannot regulate or we cannot. We we have to regulate and influence. And I have I got today this great example from IV cars showing how the consumer it's. You know, there will be few percent of consumers to be convinced to use more sustainable solution because they want to. But the majority of the consumers will be uh, convinced when it will be financially more attractive. And this is how we should, I think, uh, push a bit our habits from our comfort zone to, to make better, more sustainable choices, at least at the beginning. I think it's a great point, and I, and I would love to get, and I will get back to it in a ch short, uh, short while. Just, uh, gentlemen, your your uh, first take on on the, on the topic. Thank before, you. Yeah, you can you can speak, and uh, yeah, the production is gonna. Okay. Be up. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, it's very important to the digitalization because uh, for the people for new type of services and innovation, it's important to reach digital data the data we can share together through new type of application for example uh, operator as a provider uh, city mo mo mobile application uh, to take a lot of data from uh, the user of uh, public transport services and it's necessary to build new type of services on this on this data to care about uh, uh, about this data and uh, exactly for electromobility uh, will be important for uh, the the high uh, level of service will be important to share data about uh, free chargers for example 
So uh, a lot of provider here in Czech Republic, exactly in Prague, uh, they uh, they have uh, closed data because that's uh, part of uh, business, uh, and uh, they want to share this type, uh, this data. And uh, but but I hope it's important to build platform for sharing data, exactly for uh, care about security of uh, this data, about personal data. But uh, digitalization is important for me. Thank you. Sveinung? Yeah, um, I'm happy you mentioned this with the free charging because the, in Oslo we had free charging. Uh, the result was that uh, every charger was occupied. And it wasn't occupied by cars who were charging, it was occupied by cars who were parking. So uh, we were in, in the Norwegian EV Association, we were advocating the city should start charging uh, our members. Uh, because that was in our members' interest. And when they started to, to charge for parking, suddenly was the chargers were freed up. You could easily access charging again. But you, hadn't, you couldn't do that with, with the free charging. So it's a good example that uh, you know, we have good intentions with policies, but they doesn't necessarily work. But it's, it's also an example that commercialization is a good thing. Uh, whenever you, there's a need for a product, you should use the commercial forces and you could also, and this actually makes it cheap, cheaper also for the municipality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, question about uh, money. Uh, does it, does financial incentive, uh, is financial incentive always enough? Because uh, we looked at the example of, of Norway and uh, electric vehicles, uh, basically growth. It was highly incentivized by, by, by subsidies, basically. We are dealing uh, in Europe with, uh, with, with uh, quite quite uh, large pressure on um, uh, automotive sector in terms of changing their approach towards uh, electric vehicles but uh, sometimes it's not feasible uh, financially for, for for those big companies how to accommodate sustainability goals with financial uh, so to say I don't know uh, reason yeah I think uh, as an economist economist I'm, I'm uh, I like the you know idea of external external externalities. And the thing is that with the, the environment, you have to be, uh, if you're buying a polluting vehicle, you should have to pay for that. So you, and, and also in environmental policies in general, it's a good thing to, to tax what you don't want. And then you get extra funding that you can spend on the things that you do want, like subsidies for electric vehicles or, or tax rebates, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's possible to, to tune the financial system and the taxation system. Uh, to 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 get what you want without a huge financial burden. Of course, uh, the situation of Norway is, is extreme because our EV pol policy started with the uh, with the the intention of establishing car manufacturing in, in Norway of electric vehicles, and sadly sadly we didn't succeed in that. But the Czech Republic, you succeeded in <laughs> in putting up manufacturing of of electric vehicles, and and the Skoda Enyaq is one of the most popular cars in, in Norway this year. So you managed something that we didn't. Uh, and of course, I understand the fear of car manufacturers as well. Maybe they need a gradual uh, development, but they need to change their production. And you've succeeded in doing that. You have to continue. Maybe it have to be gradual, uh, but I understand it's more difficult. Uh, and, and especially the fear of job loss is, is, is important to address. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, if I may add, uh, I think that what was uh, touched by you, and I think it's extremely important, is to take into account all the real cost for the environment into the price of the project. And at this moment, we are getting totally different approach and totally different economic values. Because if we are talking about the bottle of water, plastic bottle of water now, which costs almost nothing but if we would calculate whole the, throughout whole the value chain the emissions the the fact that it's not recycled the fact that it's not uh, refillable etc etc we and add all these values to the price we would see that it starts to be extremely expensive packaging for example but we are not doing it and it's exactly the same story with cars and and utilities and other tools where well if we would start to think from the big perspective and take a bit different measures, we would get a bit different outcome. Thank you. Um, 
Jeremy, when uh, Czech Republic will become uh, Norway uh, in terms of uh, electric vehicle uh, usage? What's your take? When Ch the Czech Republic will become like Norway in terms of uh, electric ve vehicle usage? Uh, when are we going to grow our potential in terms of uh, electric vehicles in the Czech Republic? Because the usage that we are having today is uh, at some point, but we are aiming uh, uh, a lot higher. So what is your opinion on that? Are we managing to meet the targets? Uh, I hope so, because <laughs> I uh, have heard about uh, subsidies for uh, and uh, a lot of uh, subsidies of ministry uh, last time was spent for building charging stations. And uh, but uh, exactly here in Prague, we see that uh, building the charging station, it's not cost effective. So uh, it's now uh, a problem to accelerate uh, the electromobility. And uh, the part of plan we would like uh, prepare, it's uh, exactly support to building charging station. And uh, it's about direct support from the city. So exactly we are talking about subsidies, for example, uh, we can uh, we can support uh, electromobility with uh, provide free parking lots because uh, the parking and uh, uh, and providing uh, the car and using the car is in the city it's 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 a huge problem because there is not a lot of or there is not enough places for parking. So uh, we can uh, we can push electromobility through provide uh, subsidies or uh, provide free parking lots. So uh, there are a different way how to support uh, support uh, the electromobility here in Czech Republic. Uh, always it's uh, it's not through uh, the direct financial. It's about it's about uh, supporting uh, the electromobility, for example, through parking or or to, uh, through uh, maybe one time uh, a toll system to entrance in the city and so on. Financial incentives. So, you wanted to add something to that? Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that we did uh, in Oslo, we did a detailed mapping of where you actually need a charging infrastructure, uh, a public charging infrastructure for, for home charging, charging when you're parked. Uh, and it's, it's, it was a very useful um, uh, thing that we did uh, that has saved a lot of money for, for the city. We also see now that we know where we built wrongly. So some places we built, we spent uh, it was cheap to put up charges there, but nobody are using them now after we introduced pricing. So we know where we wasted money, we know where it's good use of money, and typically where the best use of money uh, is the more expensive chargers, actually, but they are also more used and people are willing to pay for, for charging there. And also I think it's uh, important to say that we have one of four cars in Oslo are battery electric, but still, the, the 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 city is not crowded with chargers, at, as you many would believe. It's it's quite limited the number of chargers we we actually need. I think in a situation with, where all cars are battery electric, and also I, I had a, a little uh, I cheated a little bit. I looked at the sales numbers for for the Czech Republic, and I found out that you have ten doubled the sales uh, from last year to to this year. Uh, and that makes it only two years until you're on a hundred percent battery electric vehicle here in Czech. Well, let's hope it goes this way. So <laughs> that's a good match. Well, well, let's see. Let's see if, if we're going to meet there, uh, guys. I asked uh, the previous panel, and I'm going to ask today because uh, we, we we are there are many stakeholders here, but not many business uh, private sector stakeholders. And um, you were talking about holistic uh, ecosystem approaches that uh, are uh, inclusive. And what would you if we talk about the private sector that we need to include more and more into uh, this uh, topic of change? Um, what would you need from the private sector in order to push this change that we are talking um, uh, talking about forward? Or is the cooperation, from your perspective, uh, good enough? Lukas, yes? Maybe be because uh, 
What we see with our partners uh, that are from uh, from private sector is that they usually need not help but to remove obstacles. So uh, I would start with removing obstacles. Uh, there's a uh, <laughs> yeah, the right uh, the right wing economists they they always say no to the state no Less. not help us uh, just yes. <laughs> leave us alone. So uh, we're talking I about regulatory uh, obstacles basically now. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, it's uh, and it's such an example is for example. Uh, here in the Czech Republic, uh, water management for buildings. Uh, um, if you buy, for instance, a house in a, in a natural reserve and you want to build your own water treatment plant, it's so difficult that it's actually easier to build it illegally. So you do something illegal to protect the nature. And uh, the situation here in Prague is, is not much different. Uh, if you want to build uh, a uh, grey water management system or rainwater uh, management system, the regulation is so uh, difficult that it's much easier uh, to uh, to go for the normal um, uh, water pipelines. Uh, even though it's actually more expensive, it's cheaper to build your own uh, grey water management system uh, than to to get water from the from the pipelines. Uh, but um, the regulation is so exp so so difficult that 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 it's so so. I would say first remove the obstacles and then help. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, really nice insight, ladies. Uh, um, from your point of view, um, private sector involvement. Yeah, uh, representing business, I would say that what is necessary from our side is uh, to resign from this short ter term looking at profit and loss statement and this is a bit difficult always when you represent the business because you are having stockholders stakeholders and a lot of people engaged counting on the results but the reality is like Tomra having 50 years of experience it takes time sometimes it takes a lot of time to implement good circular solutions but in long perspective it pays off but you have to be able to risk and you have to be able to have the strategy for more than two years. And sometimes it's very difficult. Great point. Uh, Long-termism is not uh, an issue only within private sector, but with political cycles as well. As, as we know, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, politicians and are elected for four exactly. years. Exactly. And it links because it's difficult for business to have long-term strategy if we don't know how, for example, the law will look like in in two, three years. And this is also where we have to cooperate and understand the needs of both sides, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Karin, you want to add something to that? I was just thinking that uh, what we see in our cluster is that maybe big private companies often team up, as I think I also mentioned in my, my speech, that also often team up with startups and, and get uh, very useful information, feedback, ideas from the startups that they can use in their mm -hmm. work. So. Teaming up big private companies with startups is something that we see a lot uh, in, in our cluster work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is no electromobility without the private sector. Uh, gentlemen, uh, how do you perceive uh, the development in terms of uh, EV infrastructure and private sector's involvement in this development? Mm, we know that infrastructure is a problem in the Czech Republic. Uh, uh, how's, how's Norway? I think if you if you look at the state level, we started to subsidize fast charging because it wasn't a good economy in the beginning. Uh, but it it was quite surprisingly how quickly it became a booming economy. And if you look at the charging industry now uh, in in uh, Norway and the Netherlands, this is a, a lot of money. It's 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 a big part of the economy. And of course, when you when you have so many cars, electric cars in Norway. You have also a demand for charging services. You have a demand for service. You're creating a green economy by having the initial demand of electric vehicles. So it's been really encouraging to see how fast the, the, the charging companies have developed and how they have uh, built large uh, scale companies and delivering um, better services in a very short time. Um, maybe a good case also for the Czech Republic. Uh, were there concerns before it all started? If you look back from different stakeholders. 
question. And how did you manage to overcome those concerns? I think you, looking at these companies, they were quite small in the beginning. So, of course, uh, I think it was more about hope on establishing uh, car manufacturing in Norway, which was the, in the, uh, the beginning of the industrial policies, which began already in the early 90s with our EV policies in Norway. So, strong fundament has to come early uh, in order to build a sufficient <laughs> so system. It was more, more, more of a hope uh, of establishing something. But you, we got something different than, than we expected. We didn't get a car industry, but we are uh, pioneers in, charge, in the charging industry. We also are now building three to four battery uh, factories in Norway, large-scale battery factories for electric vehicles and maybe also for, for the power grid. Mm. So the battery technology has changed uh, a lot of things also in, in the power uh, electricity industry. Uh, and of course, seeing this development is quite different from what we expected. But of course, all acti activity we do, even with electric vehicles, creates a new type of economy and a green economy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Jaromir, is there a, maybe a case study for the Czech Republic um, in terms of um, electromobility development to look up for those cases in Scandinavia, for example? Sorry. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, I think it's, uh, it's quite reserved here in Czech Republic to uh, cooperate together because we are a quite small country and uh, it's not so big opportunity for the company to grow up quite fast and uh, not so many people have got uh, electric vehicle. We are talking about a uh, thousand cars. So for, uh, for me, it's a very, very big uh, challenge to uh, roaming of the services to motivate the operator to share services across uh, across uh, the market and uh, acceptation of standards because if you would like to cooperate together you need to accept uh, the standard standardization of the services so i think that's uh, that's a huge opportunity here to push the company to cooperate together and we are thinking about i about it uh, when we just now thinking about uh, prepare the public tender for a uh, charge point operator. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your insight. Uh, I would love to talk to you uh, more, but unfortunately we are running out of time. There are planes to be caught. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before, yes, before, before we finish, I would uh, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. I would like to thank uh, online viewers for watching us, and I would like to thank Norwegian Embassy, Institute of Planning and Development, and uh, IC, uh, ICT Operator for helping to basically do this debate, and I'm glad that we opened up the discussion. I hope it's going to be a follow-up uh, sometime later on. Um, thanks, and please don't leave yet. Let, uh, come, let, let us uh, gather here for a last group photo and then uh, you're free to go. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks again for great discussions today, um, for amazing insight into how we build our sustainable future in the cities. And before we finish off, I would like to give word to the gentleman to sum it up uh, uh, in a few sentences and maybe give us some hint on what can we follow on in the next months, in the next debates. So please, gentlemen. Thank you, Nikita. I will add just a few closing remarks. And this is a privilege for the viewers of uh, the recording because uh, the people who were here presently in the camp did not have the opportunity to see it. So let me just wrap up quickly. Uh, today uh, we had a great opening presented by Geir and Mr. V. Chimrel from the Prague City Council and then we organized the program in four different sections. We started with presenting the smart city concepts and as we learned from our dear colleagues from um, Stavanger and other Norwegian cities there is a broad cooperation network which we take as a great inspiration for the Czech or even Central European cities. Then we moved to the open data presentations. Uh, we were really proud of being able to present our Prague's data platform called Galemio, and uh, we were assured by the Norwegian colleagues that this is something that they 
uh, really appreciate and that they would like to implement in their home cities as well. We continued with presenting the EVs and a clean mobility for the future and we learned um, what is the secret recipe of Norwegian cities towards the more sustainable city transportation. Uh, we talked a lot about different sorts of incentives, tax discounts or possibly regulations which make it obligatory for certain operators to purchase new vehicles in purely electrical standard. And last but not least we talked about sustainable buildings and about recycling uh, both in um, the production and also processing of the collected waste. Uh, I think that today was a really hugely inspirational day for all of us and what matters the most, of course, it what happens is what happens after the conference. I have some good news and rumors from, from um, the background. Um, and I believe that in the upcoming months, we will be able to apply for at least two joint projects along with our Norwegian colleagues, which is great news. And I also look forward to be able, hopefully, to join some of the conferences taking place in Norway or other Nordic countries in 2022. And last but not least, as I learned, our dear Norwegian colleagues are also very interested in joining our efforts and forces uh, when the Czech Republic will be hosting the EU presidency in the second half of 2022. So as you can see, there are really many great ideas that we could be ongoingly cooperating together and I would once more very much like to thank bo both to Guy and Terje from the Norwegian Embassy in Prague, to my dear colleagues Christina and Teresa from um, the city of Prague and last but not least to the camp crew uh, who did take really a great care uh, for us the whole day. So one final word to Guy and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Adamir. Just to confirm that this conference just confirmed the closeness and the possibilities for cooperation. And I think the spirit and the engagement and enthusiasm coming out of the speakers and the interest to achieve new results, not only technology-based, but also, shall we say, society, uh, consumer, uh, citizen-driven processes are also part of it. And I think there are really good chances for good opportunities and as it said opportunity knocks for 2022 and we have already in business we will look at the concrete plans and also see how we can get smart city more smart city projects uh, through norway Czech cooperation but ending on that i must say it's been a privilege and to work with Jeremy with bednanek and his team uh, i must say it's been so nice it's been not only pleasure, but it's been very much based on, on, on real concrete elements on how to achieve results. It's not up there. And I think it's very important when we work with Smart City, we have to take citizens good solutions as a basis and work upwards and then create the networks. And that's been demonstrated here today. So I will find that note. I will really thank Jeremy. Christina, Teresa, and also uh, the camp, uh, and Nikita, Nicola, for the good cooperation and for the team assisting. And also, not least, to our moderator. You have been impressive, uh, Nikita. You have been very good and really shown. So I have a small appreciation on behalf of the Norwegian Embassy, uh, which I would like to hand over to you. So thank you very much, and I wish you all the viewers out there that so just to say to you, we are in business. Thank it you. was a pleasure, Guy. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again. Thank you. Great projects are coming. Please maintain that good energy, and hopefully we meet each other soon and follow with the topic. Thank you, and have a nice day.